Uh, we're now uh, moving into the public session of our meeting today, so I welcome people to the committee's fifth meeting in 2019 of the Royal Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I remind everyone, please, to make sure your mobiles are on silent. Uh, the first item on, on the agenda is subordinate legislation covering genetically modified organisms. The consideration of one affirmative instrument on genetically modified organisms, deliberate release, etc. Miscellany Amendments, Scotland Regulations 2019. That's quite a mouthful. The committee will take evidence from the Minister for Rural Affairs and the Natural Environment, and the motion is seeking the approval of the affirmative instrument will be considered at item two. Members should note there have been no representations to the committee on this instrument. I'd like to welcome from the Scottish Government, Murray Goujon, the Minister of Rural Affairs and the Natural Environment, Helen Stanley, the Senior Policy Advisor, John Kerr, the Head of Agriculture Policy Division, and Juliet Harkins, the Solicitor Legal Director of the uh, Scottish Government. Cabinet Secretary, I, I, uh, I Cap no, promoted you. <laughs> Maybe that's wishful thinking. Uh, Minister, I'd like to ask you to make a brief opening statement <clears throat> and try and limit it to three minutes, <clears throat> please. In no problem. I'll try to explain this as, as briefly and concisely as I can, but thank you very much for having me along uh, to consider this SSI today. And I wish to move the motion S5M15628 and ask that the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee recommends that the genetically modified organisms deliberate release miscellaneous amendments Scotland Regulations 2019 be approved. Now, the primary purpose of this SSI is simply to allow Scotland to do what the EU law intends and bring our current legislation up to date. It would provide Scottish ministers with the powers to continue our policy of opting out of growing future EU-approved genetically modified crops and it introduces powers of enforcement in that respect. Now, that is the stated policy of the Scottish Government, and this statutory instrument allows that to continue, and we will not allow GM crops to be grown in Scotland. The legislation updates out-of-date references and removes outdated provisions in a number of related domestic GM regulations, and in particular, this SSI uh, includes provisions that allow for limits to be applied to the geographical scope of EU marketing consents for GM cultivation, if so demanded by Scottish ministers or another member state. So so that means that we can ensure Scotland is excluded from any consents to cultivate future EU-approved GM crops during any transition period. But of course, if there is no Brexit deal, Scotland's policy of no GM crop cultivation will continue as this area is devolved, and any decisions when it comes to GM crops will be for the Scottish Government. This SSI also introduces appropriate investigatory powers, offences and penalties to enforce the limits on the geographical scope in Scotland. Now, while this uh, SSI itself isn't entirely connected to Brexit, it transposes, transposes current EU legislation into domestic law, uh, as we made clear we would do in our programme for government, and it sits alongside a raft of other SIs and SSIs to prepare for a no-deal Brexit. Uh, the committee will be uh, well aware that in a separate exercise, DEFRA has been drafting EU exit amending SIs on our behalf for directly applicable EU legislation in accordance with the protocol set out by the Scottish Parliament. These SIs are for a no-deal scenario to ensure that appropriate EU rules are in domestic law and that will be important for us to maintain our GM crop-free status. We will also be laying our own EU exit SSI to fix the legislative deficiencies in our principal regulations. So because this SSI is about transposing recent changes made by the EU into our into our law, we will also have to fix these regulations in another EU exit SSI, which we will be intending to lay later this month. That EU exit SSI will ensure that on exit day, our two current Scottish statutory instruments continue to be operable after EU exit. So I, I hope that that explanation provides some clarity on the purpose and process involved here and that members are assured of the importance of passing these regulations in, into the law and will agree the motion. But I'll be happy to take uh, any questions that the committee may have. Thank you, Minister. And the first question will be from Peter Chapman. Peter. Thank you, uh, convener, and I would need to declare an interest as a, as a uh, partner in the farming business. I mean, it's, it's maybe more of a statement than a, than a, than a question. I mean, uh, my, my 
position is I fundamentally disagree with this, the, this position of the Scottish Government on, the, on GMs in, in particular. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's holding us back as, a, as an industry. I do accept that there's maybe nothing at the moment that we would particularly wish to grow in Scotland, but I think we're, by turning our back on science, I think we're doing a, a, a disservice to our farming uh, colleagues, and I think it's fundamentally the wrong decision to, to go down this road. Now, I don't expect I'm going to change the Minister's views in, a, in any way, shape or form. But I just feel that <clears throat> this is the wrong policy. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's always a bad idea to turn your back on science, and there's no science, as I understand it. I would ask the Minister, where's the science to back up the, the position that the government takes, that the GM crops are all bad and we should, be, we should turn our back on them? So that's my question. Where's the science to back up what you're asking us to agree to? You, you, you may comment. Uh, Mr Chapman's made an important point, although I won't be asking any questions, I'm just convening the meeting. I think it's important to save any questions being asked at a future date, that I am also a member of a farming partnership. Uh, but uh, I do that just for openness, not because I believe it's necessary. Minister. Uh, thank you. I mean, of course, the, the member's more than entitled to his opinion on that, and that's where we, we just have a different take on the policies here. That uh, The stated policy of the, the Scottish Government is that we don't allow GM crop cultivation, and essentially that's, there is no policy change here in terms of implementing this SSI. We're not seeing any policy change, um, uh, but I mean, this SSI also means that if there was at any point in the future the Government wished to uh, not be part of or not to take that opt-out, that is also the case. But, I mean, we believe that it's important to transpose this EU directive into Scottish law that allows us to take that opt-out. Um, that's our policy position at the moment, and we do not intend to change that. OK, I, I, I suspect we're not going to get any further on that, along that line of question, the uh, convener, so I, I'll okay, leave Stuart, it there. thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, just as an observation, I fundamentally disagree with Peter Chapman, but not on the basis of disagreeing with the science, because we don't oppose this on the basis of science, but on the basis of Scotland being a pure and natural environment uh, for which our uh, wonderful food is produced. It differentiates us from regimes. However, a uh, more substantive point, if I may. Um, reading the uh, SSI, it, it's clear to me uh, and I, I'm sure this is correct, that this refers to the cultivation of, uh, of crops and that therefore it does not, and I'd ask the Minister to confirm that therefore it does not apply uh, to animals and it does not apply to the importation of genetically modified materials. The member is correct and it, is, it just relates to the cultivation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, you had a question. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good uh, morning to the panel. Uh, just a few qu quick questions. Uh, can, uh, the policy, it says in the, uh, 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 the paperwork we have that the policy objective of this order is to provide Scottish ministers with the powers to opt out of growing future EU-approved GM crops. Um, can the minister outline uh, what advice they've taken uh, that would underpin its belief that it has the power uh, to opt out of such EU legislation under devolved competency? Uh, sorry, in relation to what we currently do at the moment, or in no, relation so, to... So, uh, do, you, do you currently have an opt-out? Well, exercise? using the transitional powers, yes, we right. currently opt out of that at the moment. So this is something that, I mean, in terms of the what we're looking to transpose, uh, from the EU directive. This is also a position that I think the Welsh Government and the Northern Ireland intend to transpose this directive as well so that they have that opt-out too. Um, and this is in use in other member states, I think 19 other uh, member states across the EU as well, and where there are specific regions within countries who have decided to opt out of this. Okay, that, that's very helpful, thank you. Um, is it fair to say that there are currently no GM crops grown in Scotland, nor have ever been? Uh, therefore, there would be no substantive change to what happens currently in agriculture. No, there would be no substantive change. That's helpful. And my final short question is, if the you, you, you mentioned uh, uh, potential transitional deals or future relationships that the UK might have with the EU, um, if uh, any of those discussions uh, or part of those discussions was any negotiation around uh, the UK um, 
producing GM crops, would it be the case, therefore, that these would only be grown in England and not in any of the other regions where you believe there's a, a policy differential? You mean if that was included in any part of future trade yes. deals? I mean, that would be a matter of huge concern for us. Um, but as it stands, I mean, right now we have the powers, it's, this is a devolved area, so even if we were to end up in a, a no-deal Brexit situation, we have the powers to, to make our own decisions in this regard, though there would be elements of this SSI that would still be useful for us to, that we would still, powers that we would still use in, in relation to a, a no deal Brexit. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately those powers are devolved, devolved but in relation to future trade deals, I, I mean, that, that would be a, a huge area of concern for us. Uh, do you mind if I ask one final Yeah, I, I think I'd just make a point, is an earlier observation you made, uh, Jamie, on the fact no GM crops have been grown in Scotland. And the, the minister didn't answer. I think, in fairness, to say there was a trial period of GM crops going in Scotland, which some of it happened on the Black Isle, but the, there has been none happened since then. Just for a point of clarity, and Jamie, yes, do. Sorry, I didn't question. come back on that one. Yeah. I, I appreciate the uh, the the, the uh, convenience clarification uh, on that point. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot my question. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I was I was, uh, I was going to ask: Is the, is the Scottish government willing to? Um, whilst they have a, an existing policy position on what is quite a catch-all phrase of GM crops, is the government committed to at least maintaining an open mind and open dialogue with the farming industry, uh, and have no interest to declare in that respect, uh, that uh, in the future they're willing to uh, review the policy as and when uh, such uh, evidence is presented to them, either scientific or otherwise? Well, we're always continuing to engage with with uh, with the farming industry. Anyway, of course, you know that's vitally important to my role, uh, as it is to the cabinet secretary for the rural economy too. I mean, that is our, st however, that you know that is our, our stated policy position at the moment that we wouldn't cons we wouldn't be looking to change that uh, anytime soon. But in terms of ongoing dialogue, I mean, that's something we continually engage in, and we will, of course, be happy to continue to do that. Thank you. Okay. The next question is from John Finney. John. Yeah. Thank you, um, convener. Uh, good morning, Minister Panel. Uh, Minister, if you're going to turn your back on anything, turn your back on those who would seek to change the status in Scotland uh, and, and the, the protection of its natural environment. C can I, please, uh, can, can I ask you, and being a simple ad, I go to the explanatory note, which I accept is not the regulation, but if, if I read you this section from it, these regulations give effect to Article uh, 4, subparagraph 5 of the Deliberative Release Directive, enabling Scottish ministers to take measures to ensure compliance with that directive, and this is the bit, by introducing investigatory powers, offences and penalties. Can you, can you give some further information on that? Is there a time frame or indeed will that be one of the SIs or a series of SIs that we're likely to see in the coming months? Or what time frame, please? In, in terms of a time frame, uh, yeah, I'll ask Helen to, to answer that question. But the, that section is really just to ensure that, I mean, if anybody does breach the regulations that we have, we have the enforcement powers there to actually take action uh, in relation to that and introduce penalties uh, as a result of that as well. But I'll ask Helen about the time frames. Um. It's all right, Helen, don't push the button. It's, oh, it's, all, it's all done. For... Okay. No, just... <laughs> Leave it alone. <laughs> It'll all come on for you. Is it OK? Um, in, I, I didn't fully understand what you meant by in terms of timeframes. I mean, once this legislation is in force, then any sort of offences and penalties within the legislation will, be, it will take immediate effect. Um, as you say, that at the moment there are no GM crops out there that are um, sort of commercially viable in Scotland really at the moment anyway. So it's debatable whether or not anybody is likely to um, sort of create an, or, or create an offence that, that they would be prosecuted um, using these um, sort of new powers anyway. But um, I... Perhaps, if I, if I could, then, um, Kavina, um, does the creation of new powers suggest a deficiency with the existing arrangements? Well, certainly um, the opt-out itself were, were new um, powers that were, that were given, that were sort of created by the um, EU. So um, it's up to member states that wish to, that, that wish to use the opt-out to make sure that they have the correct uh, uh, sort of powers within, within their own legislation. So yes, 
in that sense, because the opt-out was a new thing, then yes, we did need new sort of powers and offences to, uh, or offences and penalties to be able to um, make sure that people were compliant with with these new um, with, with the opt-out. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Richard Lau. Richard. Yes, uh, good morning. First, can I say that in a comment made earlier, Scotland is a country, not a region. Indeed. Uh, and basically, uh, can you correct me, uh, Minister, this has been Scottish Government policy for years in regard to GM crops, is that correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. And as I say, this SSI is, wouldn't be changing any policy at all, and we would simply be continuing uh, with our current stated policy. Well, uh, unlike Mr Chapman, I agree with this, the, the government's policy. And, and am I correct in saying if we don't pass this SSI, then by default GM crops could creep into Scotland, debasing our reputation as a good food nation? I mean, if this wasn't to pass, I mean, we have, through the, the transitional arrangements anyway, we have, we have opted out. So, I, you know, that is our position and we would still be able to do that. But I mean, what this SSI introduces, well, first of all, it updates the, it brings our legislation right up to date. We, it was a programme for government commitment that we would transpose this, this directive. Um, and as I say, even if we end up in a no deal situation in Brexit, there are elements of this, this SSI which would still be important to us, uh, particularly in, to, in relation to some of the offences and penalties that are there, in relation to the geographical scope uh, of the, of the opt-out as well. So this really, it's a continuation of what we are currently doing, but it enables us to bring our, our legislation up to date. Can I thank you for your comments on, on this? And I certainly will be supporting this proposal when it comes to the vote. Thank Are you... you. Uh, the next agenda item, Mr. Lyle, I'm sure. Uh, Mike Rumbles, yours is the next question, Mike. Thank you, Convener. So, there are no GM crops in Scotland. Uh, we've never had any GM crops in Scotland. And <coughs> apart from the tests, we have never had any GM crops in Scotland. There are no proposals for having GM crops in Scotland. Nobody's come to the committee to say that there's any issue here. Mm. And all the work that the Scottish <coughs> Government has done on this legislation, with your team, uh, this comes into force two weeks before we are scheduled to leave the European Union. I just have a, a question. I mean, and, and the Minister just confirmed that this doesn't change anything at all. I just have a pretty fundamental question, is what is the Government doing here? Again, I think I outlined most of that in our, my response to, to Richard Lyle in terms of bringing our legislation up to date. Now, this is something that we committed to transposing the, the EU directive. Other countries are doing exactly the same across the UK. Wales are going to transpose this directive as well. Northern Ireland are looking to, looking to do the same because I think it is vitally important that we have this in Scottish legislation and that we have that, that opt-out there that we're able to use because we have used the opt-out Currently, in terms of some of the some crops that have gone to the to the EU for approval for commercial cultivation, we've been able to use that opt out so far. Um, so just because we haven't had EU crops grown up until now, it's vitally important for us to have this power and also to have the enforcement powers there as well. But you might only have this for two weeks. No, that's not the case, because even if we end up in a no-deal Brexit, there are still elements of this SSI that, that we would need and that we would want to have as part of our, our legislation. And ideally, this is something that we would have brought forward before now, but since the referendum, obviously, uh, there, uh, well, the, main, the, the vast majority of the, the focus has been on making sure that we are, are ready for a departure from the EU when that comes, and a lot of resource has been tied into it. I mean, you'll have seen all the SIs that have come through, the SSIs that are coming through as well, in the areas, particularly in the rural economy and the environmental side as well, where we've had uh, an awful lot of legislation to be dealing with. So ideally, it would have come forward before now, but we think it's vitally important that this legislation is in place and that we do that before we leave the EU. Can I just ask a further question? I mean, the Minister has repeatedly said, we've got transitional arrangements, we have opted out. Could the Minister be more clear on what she means by that? 
I can butt in if that would be helpful. Um, what happened with the, um, the, the directive 2015-412 uh, had uh, contained transitional provisions that allowed member states to opt out of um, one, uh, all, one, e, one, one GM crop that was already approved for um, cultivation in Europe um, and a number of others that were pending authorisation at that time. However, so, so Scotland was one of the countries, or the, Scotland as, as part of the UK was one of the sort of countries that said, well, we want to use these transitional prov provisions to opt out of the, the, the one GM crop, which is a GM maize and, and these other uh, others with pending approval. However, those were transitional arrangements. We had to um, apply to the Commission back in 2015. Um, and uh, there, there was a deadline for doing that. What this, what this, what this transposition now does allows, will allow Scotland to um, opt out of future EU-approved GM crops, i.e., ones that ones that may sort of come on stream, um, sort of over the coming months. But, but that's my point. I mean, this comes into force two weeks before we leave the EU, so we won't be subject to the EU rules, will we? Well, we will if there's a transition period under. But why Brexit. don't we wait and find out? I don't think we can wait. You know, I, I don't think this is something we can be waiting to see what happens. Well, and I'd much rather that our legislation is a fit state and it's never, ready to go regardless of the GM situation. Crops. There are no proposals for GM crops. What is the point of this? Can I just say, that doesn't mean that there won't be in the future. And I think that that's why it's important that we have these powers in place so that we can use them and that they are ready to go, especially with the SSI, which is to come, which will correct any deficiencies in this as if we leave the EU without, without a deal. But I think that we can't be waiting to see what happens and we need to make sure our legislation is fit for purpose. All these people that want to give us hold on, right. hold on. I'm going to draw this part, if I may, to, to a close, <laughs> Mr Rumbles, and move on to the next question for more and more. I think you've examined that as, about as far as you can take it. And Maureen, yours is the next question. Uh, thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, I think it's important to put on the record that um, our uh, world-leading plant breeding and research, crop research institutes won't be affected by this. I think there's sometimes a mixing up of GM crops and plant breeding, which is very unhelpful. Um, Minister, I, I think you maybe partly answered my question, which was about uh, other devolved nations uh, here, that Wales um, are taking forward this legislation. I'm not sure how Northern Ireland can, although I, I believe they, they want to do so, and that there are now 19 countries in the EU, including Germany, I think, was one of the first to um, have this legislation. So is it not that this is the norm within the EU, whether we're leaving or not, rather than the exception? Uh, yes, I would agree with that. I mean, and uh, Belgium, for an example, I think that they have a similar situation to the UK, but it's a region of Belgium which has decided to opt out of that as well. But you're absolutely right, 19 countries, so the vast majority of those in the EU have decided to, to use this opt out. And uh, Northern Ireland would be looking to do that as soon as they have an assembly in place. Um, that appears to be all the questions in Leicester anymore. OK, so there's no more questions. We'll move on to agenda item two. This is the formal consideration of motion S5M15628 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy, asking the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee to recommend that the genetically modified organisms deliberative release Scotland Amendment Regulations 2018 be approved. 2019, in, is it? Yeah, is it 18 or 19? It's, uh, I'm pretty sure, sorry, my note says 18. I, I suspect it may be it's 19. 19. 19. 19. 19, okay. My, my mistake, I'm sorry, it is 2019. So I'd like to invite uh, the Minister for the Rural Affairs and Natural Environment to move the motion S5M. 15628 and ask if you have any further comments to make. I'll move the, mo the motion, but no further comments to make. Uh, are there any comments from members? Uh, Mr. Lam. Yes, I, I certainly agree with this. I think it is uh, a policy that the Scottish Government have been 
Uh, following for years, and I compliment the Minister on our, our presentation. I totally disagree again with the uh, members who say that uh, we should be allowing GM crops. Scotland is a good food nation. Scotland has excellent food, and as far as I'm concerned, I intend to ensure that it stays that way. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Arr. I, I, I was hoping that we weren't going to get statements and we'd be able to move to it, but as Ms Lyle's made one, I, I will have to let other, other committee members in. Um, Mr Chapman, followed by Mike Rumbles. Can I say that I fund fundamentally disagree with this policy? I think it is, it is, it is short-sighted that on average GM crops are, are actually cleaner than the old technology because they always use less fertiliser, they use less chemicals and they are more profitable to grow and you know i think it is it is standing in the in the in the, in the way of our farmers moving forward and being able to uh, compete in the world marketplace so i fundamentally disagree hold, hold on sorry committee members with 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 the greatest respect we, we we've been here before i i recognize everyone has different views and i have explained to you that i do find it difficult to hear when everyone else is talking at the same time I've never stopped people coming in with their views, and I'm very happy to do so, but I cannot have you all doing it at the same time. So, Mr Chapman, I think you've made your point there. Uh, Mr Rumbles, I'm happy to, for you to make your point, and if anyone else wants to make a brief point, because these points have been made, I'm happy. If not, I'm going to then move uh, to, to question whether we agree the motion. Mr Rumbles. Thanks, Convener. Yeah, this is the debate now on... on on the motion, um, and so I think we're all entitled to, to um, quite rightly, to make our points. The point I want to make in this debate on, on this motion is, I shall be supporting the Scottish Government in this. Um, I only raised my, question, my questions earlier on to the Ministers over whether we actually needed to go down this route, considering that, as I said earlier on in my question, that um, this takes effect just two weeks before we leave the EU, and this whole, this whole legislation about is opt-out from EU legislation, which would no longer apply. Um, so I find that a little strange. Um, I think this is a really important issue, and I think for the future we need to have a debate about the science and GM crops and everything else. But I think at the moment I think it's quite right that we um, maintain the status quo. Uh, so uh, I think the Scottish Government has done an awful lot of work on this. I'm, I'm very sceptical whether it was necessary but since it's before us, I shall be supporting it. Thank you. Uh, John. Uh, thank you. Well, two points. Um, I mean, one, in the question of uh, whether this is necessary or not, as Mr Rumbles has just suggested, um, the reality is this committee is doing a huge amount of work, that we, and, I, and every committee is doing a huge amount of work on Brexit, which we do not know if it is needed or not, because the totally incompetent Westminster government has not got a, cl a clear picture. So I don't know why Mr Rumbles particularly picks on this point, because the same applies to a lot of other things that we're doing, and I fully support that we need to do it. Uh, secondly, Mr Chapman talks about the science, but the reality is the science is incomplete. Uh, we have uh, had seen many uh, proposals and uh, work around uh, genetic modification and such like, but we have not yet seen the long-term effects of these on what happens to land and crops and other things over 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So the science is not complete, and I think it's misleading of Mr Chapman to say that we're going against the science. Thank you. OK, thank you, John. Uh, next uh, comment, I think, from John. Well, I think I did say, well, to my mind, a lot of this is heavy-duty legislation, but I kind of confusing, but it, it has far greater clarity than Liber Liberal Democrats' position on anything. Um, um, and um, that's, the, that's, rein, that's reinforced today from the, the confusing position of Mr Rumbles. Are they for GM? Are they against GM? Um, uh, but what isn't, of course, surprising at all is to hear from, um, from uh, Mr Chapman the fixation with profit. Uh, and that, um, of course, um, is at odds with what... I thought the committee, ironically, had all collectively agreed when we did our salmon inquiry that the precautionary principle should apply. So I think it's quite appropriate the Scottish Government have taken the contingency they have. I fully endorse it, and I fully endorse the precautionary principle continuing to apply. Thank you. Anyone else wish to make any comments? So the one comment I would make is, is that, um, if I may, just not about the motion, and I'm going to give you, Minister, a chance to, get, to come in and make comment, but if you want to respond to any of the comments you made, obviously your officials can't come in at this stage, is just that, you know, 
the, the political political comments are, are best not served on the, in the committee. It's, it's best to do that in the chamber. This is a look at the actual facts of the evidence. So, Minister, if you'd like to make a comment, if not, we'll move to uh, considering it. I'm happy for you to move to consider it. Okay. The, the question, therefore, I believe that is in front of us as a committee to decide is that whether we agree to motion S5M15628 be agreed. Are we agreed? Yes. yes. <laughs> we are not agreed. Uh, Ms Chapman uh, has said, therefore, we will need to move to a division. Okay, so I therefore... So therefore, I have to ask, could those in favour of the motion please raise their hands and keep them raised? Those, thank you. Those against the motion, that's one. And those who abstain, I'm abstaining as, as convenient. So therefore, those in favour are eight, those against are one. Those who have abstained too, therefore the motion is agreed. I'd like to thank the Minister and her officials for, for coming in this morning, and I briefly suspend the meeting to allow the panel to depart. Could I ask committee members to remain in the room as if possible so we can move straight on to the next item?
Um, welcome back to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee meeting. Uh, I want to move on to agenda item three, which is the Europe, European Union Withdrawal Act uh, 2018, and there are six notifications. We have received six consent notifications uh, in relation to the UK SIs as detailed on the agenda. These cover the common fisheries policy, CMO regulations, and organic products regulations. All the instruments are being laid in the UK Parliament in relation to the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. The common fisheries policy is categorised as partly category B. Category B means that the transition from an EU to a UK framework would be a major and significant development. I wondered if any member had any comments. Stuart. Um, just, just a very brief comment. Uh, in relation to the Common Fisheries Policy Amendment, etc., um, I very much welcome the fact that uh, it's left open uh, the competency dispute uh, about the determination of fishing opportunities um, to, to another matter. I think that's a pragmatic and sensible approach for the two governments to currently take in relation to this order, and I welcome that that's the approach that's taken. Okay, thank you. Does, are there any other comments? So, therefore, the, the question I have for the committee is, does the committee agree to write to the Scottish Government to confirm it is content for consent for the UK SIs referred to in the notifications to be given and to note a re and request a response from the Scottish Government on the wider policy matters that have been identified? Is that agreed? Yes. That is agreed. Therefore, we will now move on to agenda item four, which is the restricted roads 20 mile an hour speed limit Scotland bill. Um, I would like to invite members to declare any relevant interest. Stuart. I'm the honorary president of the Scottish Association for Public Transport, uh, which is an interest in roads. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is the committee's first evidence session on the restricted roads 20 mile an hour speed limit Scotland bill. The, the committee will now take evidence from academic, health, environmental and third sector perspective. I'd like to welcome Rod King, the founder and campaign director, 20's Plenty for Us, Stuart Hay, the director of Living Street Scotland, Dr Adam, oh, sorry, Adrian Davis, professor of transport and health at Edinburgh Napier University, Bruce White, the public health programme manager, Glasgow Centre for Population Health, and Gavin Thompson, who is air pollution campaigner at Friends of the Earth, uh, Scottish Environmental Link. Now, I don't know if you have all given evidence here at the committee before, but the way this works is that uh, you don't need to touch any buttons on the, the consoles in front of you. They will be activated for you. If you want to come in, and it's quite a big panel, uh, try and catch my eye, and, <clears throat> and I'll bring you in at the appropriate moment. Now, because there are five of you, you might not get to answer every single question, um, but I will do my best to bring you in. What I would also caution you is that uh, hopefully we'll get relatively short questions, which may be prompt short answers, which will allow more of you in. If you see my, me waggling my pen, that probably means you should wind up, because ultimately it, it gets so quick that it may fly off in your direction if you're not paying attention to me. So please don't speak uh, and keep speaking and, and look the other way. If in the unlikely event that you all look away when the question's answered, one of you will get nominated, so there's, there's no hiding. So on that basis, um, uh, I'd like to start off with the first question, which will be from Colin, uh, Colin Smith. Colin. Thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. I think this is probably the most straightforward question you're going to get um, uh, during the course of, of, of the meeting. It's simply to ask the panel uh, why you support the, the proposal to reduce the, the default speed limit uh, on restricted roads from 30 miles per hour to 20 miles per hour. And as it's such a simple question, we'll start on my right, your left, with Rod, and work along the panel with a short answer from each of you, please, Rod. Right. Well, I think we have to start off with what we have now, which is a, a 30 mile an hour limit, which was uh, set in 1934 and very much plucked out of the air as seeming reasonable. And we have to ask ourselves whether that is appropriate for nearly a, a century later when we have so many more aspirations for the way we want to use the roads, uh, public health, active travel, uh, just the ability 
for people to move around independently under their own steam. And 20 mile an hour, 30 kilometers per hour is a developing standard across the world as the safe and appropriate speed limit and speed for where pedestrians and cyclists mix with motor vehicles. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, we, we support it for, for the same reasons, and it's really about creating times and places that are safe and feel safe for people who want to walk, walk around or cycle or for kids to play. And 20 is the only way to achieve that. 30 mile an hour isn't appropriate if you want those conditions in your towns and cities. OK. Adrian. Uh, good morning. Um, so, notwithstanding what has been said, I think the one of the key things here is reducing the numbers of deaths, serious injuries and slight injuries that predominantly in cities at least happen to people outside of vehicles, uh, people that don't uh, present much of a threat kinetically to other road users but suffer disproportionately and Scotland uh, has agreed and is trying to implement, implement Vision Zero which is Vision Zero means no fatalities and life-changing injuries. So 20 miles an hour and dampening down the kinetic energy in the system is important for that. It is also, as a, a public health physician, clearly important for increasing population health, reducing the disease burden uh, and the cost to the National Health Service. Bruce. Uh, good morning. Uh, really just adding to what Adrian was saying, uh, that there's a, a great benefit in terms of reducing casualties. Currently, um, amongst uh, on 30 mile per hour roads, 60% uh, of casualties are 60% um, of serious and fatal casualties are vulnerable road users, walkers, or cyclists. Um, we also know that there's inequalities in who is likely to be a casualty. They are higher uh, in more deprived areas amongst adult pedestrians, and even higher again amongst child pedestrians. Uh, uh, across Scotland, bill like this would help address those inequalities. Gavin. Morning, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here with you this morning. Um, so just quickly to round off then, um, from my point of view, reducing the default speed limit would improve the flow of traffic, reduce congestion and emissions, and encourage more active healthier travel choices and all of these would have uh, positive impacts on air quality and so as an air pollution campaigner that's why I support the bill. Okay, Colin. Out of interest, do any of the panel know what percentage of the current 30 mile an hour roads in Scotland are restricted roads which will therefore be covered by the bill? Adrian Davis. Stuart, do you want to... I've asked this question and I believe that it's quite difficult to get that data from local authorities because it relates to uh, the number of traffic regulation orders that are out there and nobody's collated them all. Okay. Um, there's a few supplementaries on this. Uh, Richard, I seem to have you down as a supplementary uh, and then Stuart and then Mike. No? No. Okay. Mike, you go first. Thank you very much. Um, I'm referring to... Uh, publication on the Scottish Parliament Information Centre, which we've got and is publicly available. And since we're considering changing the criminal law, because it is a, it is a crime that we're, we're talking about here, breaking the speed limits, um, in, in it, it refers to research uh, on the pilot of the 20 mile an hour speed limit in the south of Edinburgh, uh, which said that the average speed of vehicles on streets provided with a 20 mile an hour speed limit has dropped by an average of 1.9 miles per hour, from 22.8 miles an hour to 20.9 miles per hour, which means that before it went down to 20, the majority of motorists were, were, were not breaking the law. But reducing it to 20 miles an hour, with the average still exceeding that limit, means that most motorists with a 20 mile an hour speed limit are breaking the law. Any comment? Who'd like to um, comment on that? A Adrian. So, first of all, what is a bit of science uh, just to explain here? So, in, in the peer reviewed literature and the science of it, of speed and kinetic energy, for every uh, one mile an hour average reduction in speed, you get a 6% reduction in collisions. This is about kinetic energy. We, don't, we know the slower people go, the more time there is to be able to make a decision to stop. So this is, you know, the faster you go, once you get over 30 miles an hour, things get a lot more dangerous. And of course, at 30 miles an hour, people of, often drive well over 30 miles an hour. So 
it is about thinking about the kinetic energy and the impact. And a one mile an hour uh, average speed reduction or 1.9, <coughs> whatever, often the way the press portray this, we see it time and again, as though it's not really worth it. But that's not understanding the science about the kinetic energy and the, the significant drop in, in collisions. And we have seen data from Portsmouth, which was the first authority in England to implement 20 miles an hour across a whole city, uh, Calderdale, uh, Bristol City, um, Warrington, that have reported significant reductions in casualties as a result. And these two link, you can see the link between it. If you reduce the kinetic energy, the likelihood is that you reduce the number of Injuries. As a coder to that point, I would like to point out that Scotland was the first place in the UK that implemented 20 miles an hour. 75 sites across 27 local authorities at the end of the 1990s, and that showed significant reductions in casualties as well. So Scotland was the first place that this started, but we do have good evidence these small average reductions are important. OK. Um well, I didn't address my question, which, which my, my question is about criminality, and, and most drivers now would be criminals. OK, Rod, Rod and then Stuart. I, I think one of the things to remember is that when you're, you're, you're setting 20 mile an hour uh, limits for, for most roads, you're including a lot of roads where the current speeds are already low and, and possibly below 20 miles an hour anyway. You, you have three tranches of roads. Those residential roads which have low speeds, the ones which have medium speeds, about 20 to 24, and the ones who were, tend to be a little bit higher, the faster roads. Now, what the research shows is that you actually get a mix of reductions in speeds. You'll get no reduction on the slow roads already. You'll get some reduction on the, uh, the medium speed roads, but you'll get a three, four miles per hour reduction on the, on, on the faster roads. Mm. Again, research shows that after the implementation of 20 mile an hour limits, the vast majority of people, and we're talking about 80% or so, are actually travelling at less than the speed at which uh, um, there will be any enforcement, i.e. they're, they're travelling below 25 <laughs> miles uh, an hour. So there is yes, good evidence that 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 uh, changes. Uh, but also the thing is, if you set a national consistent uh, limit and you get that public consensus, then you actually affect uh, the uh, compliance right the way across the spectrum of, of, of speeds, which, which, which obviously helps. My, uh, just one final supplement. My whole point <coughs> is about compliance, actually. That, that, that's the point. And anecdotally, we've got 20 miles an hour in Edinburgh and drive in Edinburgh. Obviously, sometimes the traffic, you can't drive more than 20 miles an hour. But obviously, there are people breaking the 20 mile an hour speed limit, and quite a large number of people. So it's about compliance. What is the point of having a law which most people then do not observe? Stuart, do you want to come back on that? Um, I, th I think to be aware that the behaviour is no different than a 30 mile an hour limit. In fact, it's, in fact the statistics I've seen is actually people behave worse in 30 mile an hour. So in that, that, in, in, in that, in that sense, um, people don't do that. And it, it's really about seeing lim limits are, are a limit and it's about people driving for the conditions. And in, in an urban area, a residential area, uh, people should be anticipating there will be children. Sight lines are, are limited and they should be driving at around about 20 miles. So some drivers are doing that already. And the point about introducing a speed limit is to start to shift the behaviour of those others. And you can do that partly through ed education, and so people are aware of the, the new limit, partly through engineering where necessary, and then finally through enforcement for, the, for probably the hardcore that really don't get this. Just, just as a follow-up before I bring anyone else in, I mean, with the 20 mile an hour speed limit in Edinburgh, it's been quite interesting. Uh, if you drive along at 20 miles an hour uh, as a driver, the thing you notice more than anything else is the bicyclists who are doing 30 miles an hour or 40 miles an hour down the hill. And, and a point you made, Adrian, about uh, injury. Injury is about de developing a kilojoules per, of energy at a point of impact in a limited area. Now, a bicycle will do that just uh, probably more effectively on a point of impact because it will be very narrow where they hit. So I know bicyclists are a problem, but do you think that will make people wonder, you know, the car driver saying, well, I'm being overtaken by a bicycle. Does it make it easier for a car driver to come to terms with it? And 
should we not be thinking about bicycles as well? A question. Uh, Adrian, do you want to come on? To well, that? I think um, this, is at, this is an outlier question, if I can put it that way, because it's a minor point. I mean, getting up to 30 miles now, I think it would be quite difficult for most people on, on bikes. And I think the point, the science is about mass mass and speed and there is an equation about that so it's a mass of the vehicle that's going to do more damage so hit, being hit by an hgv is the one you really don't want to get hit by because you'll be dead um so i think there is a bit of difference with uh with respect chair that um uh the, the mass is most important the size of the vehicle as it being a bike is less so uh, i don't think that's a main point for us today most people are hit by motor vehicles OK, well, as, as convener, I will take your point that I shouldn't ask outlying questions. Maybe not. But Stuart, I'll let you come in with the next question. Um, I do want to just deal with the numbers question before my question, if I may, and address perhaps uh, Dr Davis alone. Um, if you've 10 vehicles travelling through a zone, nine of them are doing 20 mile, nine miles an hour, and one of them is doing 40 miles an hour, 10% of them are breaking the speed limit, but the average is 31 so averages are the wrong way of looking at the problem. It should be medians, not averages. Is that, is that a fair observation on my part? Uh, if I can uh, answer that by, if you are travelling at 20, 29 miles an hour or 30, um, then the person that's trying to do 40 can't do 40 because they're behind you in the queue. So one of the things we've talked about in the literature about... 20 mile an hour speed limits is about pace cars. When people abide by the speed limit, then it forces other people to, to abide um, by the Sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm just exploring the arithmetic because the thrust of the previous question has been about average speeds. Yes. And average speeds are determined, and the 40 mile an hour can be at the head of the queue, not the back of the queue or the middle of the queue, that, 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 the, that the average doesn't tell you that on average, everybody, if the average is above the speed limit, that doesn't tell you that half the people are breaking the speed limit. That's, I just wanted to get okay. that on the record. If my comment is correct, as a mathematician, I speak, of course. OK, so my way of answering that, and I hope it's not ob obtuse, will be that uh, the one of the things we find across the different authorities where we've got post-implementation data is that the really high speeds come down the most, and that's one of the dramatic things. When we had people previously doing 40, they may be now doing 28, which is well above the speed limit, but they are uh, doing a lot less than, than 40. That's the best way, Mr Stevenson, I can answer that question with the data I have well, in my head. Let me, let me move on to my more substantive point, okay. which isn't restricted to uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the professor. Um, and that is simply about uh, the, the bill being re on restricted roads only. In other words, not A roads, not B roads, and not roads uh, where there is not lighting that is um, 185 or less metres uh, apart from lampposts. Um, and in a sense, that comes back to the question that Stuart, uh, he couldn't answer, um, that have we any sense of what that really means in the real world. Now, Stuart Yates said he didn't know, but with any sense really as to what uh, part of the road network this will apply to. Uh, Bruce. My understanding from Edinburgh is that it's about 80% of the roads in Edinburgh are covered by uh, the 20 mile per hour limit. So there's 20% that are, are... Right. Just can I come back and just mm -hmm. home in to be precise? Is that 20% of the distance or 20% of the number of roads? I think it's 20%. 80, 80, sorry. I'm not certain. I think it might be 20% of uh, roads, but I'm not... That are unaffected? Yes, that are unaffected. And, and I think some of those will be... The, the, there will be a decision that they were a restricted road, but actually the, 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 the speed limit should remain at 30 or, or whatever it was. Right, for, now... For, Given that the bill is just about restricted roads, is that too restrictive in terms of what we're trying to achieve in policy terms? Rod. Yeah, I, I think what the bill uh, seeks to do is to, uh, to, to set the, the right national consensus for most roads mm. which would be appropriate. What it doesn't do is take away any ability for yeah. the local authority to use its flexibility. And that's where the local authority, when 
looking at the area which it feels should be appropriate at 20 mile an hour may have 90% of roads which are restricted and clearly come into that, another 5% of roads which are unrestricted and they want to stay at, at, at 30, but maybe another 5% of roads which are not restricted but they would wish to, to actually uh, become 20 mile an hour, then what they can do is a, a traffic regulation order to make them into a restricted road which enables them to uh, uh, accommodate those. Jamie, you wanted to come in with a supplement. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good, good morning to the panel. Uh, I, I think it's fair to say from the opening comments that every member of the panel here this morning is in favour of the legislation, and it is quite a short bill. But I'm quite... Uh, it's quite striking... Uh, uh, sorry, by the principle of the bill there, then, Stuart. Um, it's quite striking, however, that nobody in the com committee can answer very fundamental and simple questions. That's how many roads or what percentage of road mileage will be affected by the legislation that we're being asked to pass. On the example of Edinburgh, there seems to even still be uncertainty around how many roads are affected in a, in a current zone, never mind any future zones. In order for us to fully uh, look at the, the, the consequences of this bill, it's entirely appropriate that we get a sense of the scale of it, yet no one seems to be able to answer that question. Why is that so? That's uh, Stuart, followed by Rod. I think that there is a... You can't do exact numbers, but what you can say... We know how many roads there are, and we know how many road mileage there are. No, no but we, basically that means counting up all the 30 mile an hours in Scotland that have an order to them. So that's what's affected, is the number of 30 mile an hour. Now, what we've got is a very developed network, and these, have, these streets have all been assessed at 30 mile an hour. Most of them would go down to 20 mile an hour, and... A few where it was deemed appropriate by local authorities would be retained at 30 miles an hour. And those sort of roads, uh, from Living Street's point of view, would be places like industrial estates, some distributor roads where there is not a lot of pedestrian activity, and that's their sort of pri primary function. But it would cover all your residential areas, and it would cover areas where you're going to have a lot of pedestrian activity, such as, such as par parks. Uh, it would cover everywhere that has a school. So I think we know where, it's going to, where, where the bill is going to have impacts. What we don't really know is how many of the exclusions we would, 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 be, would be created, because that's a different process. Rod, do you want to briefly come in? Yeah. Because I, no, I'm, just before you do, I'm just conscious that we're on question one. Um, okay. Uh, and and you, you've got a lot of more questions to answer. So, Rod, if you'd like to come in briefly, and then I'd like to move on to the next question. The reason why none of the members so, of the panel right. actually know is because the DFT and the UK government doesn't know, uh, Transport Scotland doesn't know, uh, most of the local authorities don't know because the actually mix of restricted, non-restricted, uh, a traffic regulation or the roads has just been built up over the time and there is no central database. So that's why we are ignorant. <laughs> so, okay. uh, so, 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 so there's no data and no one's done any mapping as to the, in terms of uh, the, the road mileage that currently exists in the country, in any part of the UK, and which percentage of that is, is, is classified uh, as a restricted road. There is in the, in the UK, in terms of London, has a, uh, a map of every road and every speed limit is, and, that's, and that, that, that's public, right, but there isn't for the rest of the country. But there is an aspiration to do that, I believe, on behalf of the DFT. Thank you. OK, uh, the next question actually is mine. So uh, my question is, would it, instead of um, imposing a default national speed limit of 20 miles an hour on restricted roads, um, would it be preferable? Would it not be preferable to allow local authorities to impose 20 mile an hour speed limits where they consider it appropriate? Say, flick it the other way around. So instead of a default, allow allow local authorities. Who'd like to head off on that? Gavin, do you want to go on that? Thank you. Um, I think the thing to say is at the moment um, we've touched on how local authorities um, should have power to create exemptions, but. Um, by putting the uh, onus on local authorities and they have to go through a cumbersome process so it takes a, a long time to implement 20 mile an hour uh, limits. Um, this bill would uh, speed up that process 
um, and it would be much more efficient in terms of resources, but I think also, um, and some other panelists might want to touch on this, it's about creating a norm as well, that um, the lower speed limit is becoming the norm rather than the, um, the, rather than the exception. I think that's really important when we're talking about behaviour change and travel choices. Okay, it's definitely it's set the point on the norm, but as far as Bill goes, it could have simplified the process of making it 20 miles an hour. So. Maybe, does somebody want to comment on the norm? Uh, Rod, I, I know you want to come in. I'm trying to, I'll try and balance if I may. Bruce, uh, would you like to come in? I think there's an important inequalities angle to this. Uh, across Scotland, there are uh, a mixed bag of 20 mile per hour limits. Uh, some in some authorities, like in Edinburgh, the, the, the city is covered. In other cities, there's very few 20 mile per hour limits. And we know that uh, there are casualties on, on, on 30 mile per hour roads. And we know that bringing in this kind of bill would reduce the number of casualties and fatalities and would also uh, increase levels of active travel, walking and cycling. So there's a current inequality, if you like, in terms of the distribution of where 20 mile per hour limits are, are distributed. And we know that there are higher levels of pedestrian uh, casualties in more deprived areas. Uh, and I think the point uh, Gavin made about social norms is really, really important. If, if we uh, have a, a national limit as such, uh, albeit with some exceptions that local <coughs> authorities can, di di can di dictate, then you, you create an environment of a lower speed environment, a more considerate uh, environment for, for all road users, particularly for vulnerable road users, pedestrians and cyclists who are most likely to be casualties on 30 mile per hour roads. Okay, I'm going to widen this question out and, and bring Peter in with his next question, which may then allow you to come in, Rod. Yeah, thank you, Convener, and good morning, uh, gentlemen. As an alternative to lowering the default speed limit to 20 miles per hour, the RIC has suggested the use of variable speed limits with a 20 miles limit only during peak times. Now, I can imagine the scenario of somebody at 3 o'clock in the morning driving through Edinburgh, no other cars about, nobody walking about. Is it fair under that scenario that that driver should be restricted to 20 miles per hour? Rod, do you want to come in on that? I think it's a very big question. Would you apply that to motorways, to rural roads, or, or, or would you only apply it in, in, in those places where people are, where uh, we know that a 20 mile an hour is appropriate, where people are uh, uh, mixing? Uh, it, it actually doesn't stack up, and it, it's, it's not consistent when you, when you look at the broader range of uh, 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 speed limits which we uh, have. So, I mean, I think that's answering that question. It tends not to work. You'd have people spending interminable arguments about whether it should be 7 o'clock or 7.30, it comes back in and, uh, and so on. It's much clearer if you say that is the speed limit, it exists right uh, at 24.7. Uh, Can I come back on, on something about the, uh, the, the question which you, you made about um, carrying on and, and just local authorities doing it? That really treats 20 mile an hour as an exception rather than a rule. It actually continues the current uh, situation where the public consensus is that you can drive 30 miles an hour on most roads, uh, but you know, and a few odd authorities, uh, they, they, they do set it at 20 miles per hour. Um, it, it, it endorses non-compliance. Uh, it's not a very smart way to do it. It's the way it's been done in England predominantly, where now 33% of the population live in authorities which have more or less a default 20 miles an hour. But adjacent authorities you can have which don't have uh, 20 mile an hour uh, uh, limits. So it's not a smart way to do it. A much smarter way to do it is the way this bill proposes, and that's bringing it into line much more with Scandinavian countries where there is a, a 30 kilometres per hour or 18 and a half miles an hour a default for most roads. Uh, and that sets uh, both a social consensus and it actually sets a civil liability uh, <laughs> consensus as well because if a driver is doing more than 25 miles an hour and a 20 mile an hour limit, then that driver is 100% liable for the consequences in a crash, regardless of the negligence of any pedestrians. So mm -hmm. even if people are not complying in, in, uh, to a 20 mile an hour law, right, they are uh, act actually uh, can face sanctions in, in civil liability as well. Mike, you want to come in on that? I, I mean, <clears throat> I do want to follow that up about this issue of a blanket 
approach right across rather than allowing local authorities to do it. In a tactical briefing to us this morning, which came as a surprise to me and I think other members of the committee, it seems that when an A road goes through a village, say I'm, I represent many people in the rural Aberdeenshire, so if we look at all the villages across rural Aberdeenshire, the, the main roads will not be affected by this legislation, but we were told this morning that every single road that leads in every village that leads off from this main road that goes through all our villages, every single one of them is going to have to have signage put up to say that this is a 20 mile an hour road. The cost to Aberdeenshire Council alone will, will run into, I, I don't know, how much? Have you any comment on the feasibility of, of and the cost of having this blanket approach across the country? Primary re responsibility of local authorities when setting speed limits is, is to take into account the needs of vulnerable road users. And I would ask whether that main road needs a 20 mile an hour or a 30 mile an hour limit. If a 20 mile an hour is appropriate, then the local authority can set a traffic regulation order to actually make that part of the road a 20 mile an hour uh, limit and then you would not need any signs at side roads. I'm, I'm, I'm going to let the question on cost just ride a little bit because I know uh, John wants to come in with more detailed information on costing so perhaps we could let that ride. I'm going to bring in Stuart um, and then I know Peter wants to come in with, with a follow-up. I'm, I'm not looking for a long answer but perhaps where the answer might be. Uh, based on what Rod said, a third of English authorities essentially have blanket 20, implying therefore two thirds don't. Do we see differential accident and health outcomes? Because if we've got that evidence that a third is one approach and two thirds is not, is there actually evidence available that would help us? Who'd like to come in on that? Adrian, do you want to come in on that? Or? So I think this is picking up on a point I made earlier that the evidence from towns and cities that have implemented 20 miles now and done the evaluation, Bristol's done the single most detailed evaluation and shown the reduction in, uh, in deaths calculated and uh, serious and slights. Warrington, uh, Portsmouth originally, as well as the Scottish original uh, data. So we do have good evidence that reducing from 30 to 20 miles an hour brings about a reduction in, in the deaths and the serious and the slight injuries, if that is the point that uh, Mr Stevenson is. Well, do, do, do forgive me, yeah. I accept that, but we know that there's a whole series of different interventions different authorities will do to try and drive down. So looking at what's happening in one is, of course, part of the answer. I was merely looking to see if the shape of the graph in ones who've not done it is different okay. from yeah. those, the ones that, you know, it's not about Bristol yeah, comparing absolutely. Bristol, it's about Bristol comparing yep. Cheshire somewhere. So always with decent evaluations, you need a comparator, you need to be able to yeah. sh show what happened when, if you didn't do it. So the calculations were done in the Bright study for Bristol, which showed that the there was a drop, and the same for Calderdale as well, that there was a drop relative to areas that didn't do, do the implementation. Right. Um, with all other things being equal, which is always a difficult issue. Yeah, indeed. Right. Thank you, uh, Peter, and then we're going to move on to the next question. I just yeah. want to explore my question a wee bit more, in particular with Mr Hay, because Mr Hay said it was important to drive through the conditions. So I remind, I remind the, the, the panel, this is somebody at 3 o'clock in the morning in Edinburgh, no cars about, no, nobody walking. Is it fair to ask that driver to be running at 20 mile an hour, or is it not perfectly reasonable to say that at that time, 30 mile an hour would be, would be perfectly OK. Um, so it's about driving to the conditions. Stuart, bring you in and then Gavin. I, I, think, I think you have to consider the conditions at that point, which is your vis visibility is re visibility's reduced because it, it, it's night time. You're, you've, you're, your stopping distances are different. On certain days of the week, you might have pe people that might have had a drink wandering around as well. So there's a whole lot of factors that you need to take into account when, when you... Um, when you're bringing it in. And another point about this is, if you bring in variable, do you sign, do you sign these um, and it causes confusion for drivers and you just have to look at the, <laughs> the problems that are being created on bus lanes where there's different times and different places and, and the controversy around that. So you'd be repeating that issue if you had a variable. I think it's much clearer to say it's an urban area, the correct speed is 20 mile an hour. Yeah, I was going to make a, a, a similar point or just expanding on that, that 
there will be pedestrians out and about in the middle of the night and there, there might not be that many, um, but we can never predict where there will be pedestrians and where they might need to get to and they deserve safe streets, the same as someone walking about at peak time or, or rush hour. Thank you. I think we'll move on to the next question, which is Jamie Green. Jamie. Thanks, Convino. Um, and I think we're sort of moving in different directions. Apologies if we're going over some old ground on this, but I don't think anyone's suggesting that nighttime pedestrians should face less safe conditions than daytime pedestrians. I think the premise of Mr Chapman's point was just around a sensible approach to uh, quiet roads and speed restrictions r applying at different times of day, depending on the issues. I think it's a, f a fair point uh, to, to raise. But I, I want to go back to something that Mr Thompson raised, and it's further to the convener's own question around the, exist the status quo uh, under exemptions versus what would happen in future. Um, uh, uh, is it correct to say, Mr Thompson, that you said that the current process of local authorities that have 30 mile per hour roads that want to change them to 20 mile per hour, that that process is cumbersome or onerous upon them? Did you say that? Yeah. Okay. And what makes you think that the bill will change that? And, and can you point to the section of the bill that makes it clear to us that that process will be easier or less onerous? Mm. Okay. Um, it's a one page bill, so it should be easy to yeah. spot. Okay. Well, uh, what makes me say that to begin with is the pace of uh, change of local authorities that have implemented 20 mile an hour limits that has taken many years that has to be done through the TRO. And so simplifying it as this bill does make me. Sorry, do, where, how does it do that? Just explain to us in, in simple terms. I, I, I can't do that. Okay, sorry. fine. So, I, I just the, the point being, the substantive point here, though, is that uh, moving from uh, applying from a 30 to a 20, it, it will be different going from a 20 to 30. And, I, and it's, it's still unclear to me as to why that would be better, easier, more simple. And, and it's open to anyone in the panel that wants to answer that. Stuart, do you want to come in? Quickly, I, th I think you, you take the example of... Edinburgh in terms of how you did that uh, and there's very few 30 mile an hour streets left they're in the, the, therefore it's been deemed appropriate so under the new law you would only be concentrating on those streets and retaining those at 30 mile an hour rather than taking all the streets that needed to be 20 mile an hour so you have a much shorter list of streets which means there's less scope for a, scope for objections and the TRO process works much more easily in terms of advertising um, and all those sort of things that you would do. So I, I guess no, no one's really explained to me, and maybe it's a question for the, the, the owner of the bill, uh, but um, how will the new process differ technically from the current process? And Edinburgh is a different example because they already have a blanket 20 mile per hour approach. Therefore, by default, there are fewer roads to exempt. But if you look at a scale of zero to 100%, where no one applies for an exemption from the 20 restriction up to go back to a 30, uh, up to 100% where everyone does it. Does anyone have any idea of the scale of local authorities and the, and, and the volume of, t of TROs that may be needed to move from 20 to 30 in relation to the volume that currently exists from 30 to 20 to make it comparative? Yep. Um, right. right. I mean, some of these answers are really in the detail, which, which we don't have the, the data to. But if I can say from the experience of, of UK Im Im implementations, uh, you're looking at about 80% of the roads in, a, in an authority which are currently 30 would, would get a 20 mile an hour limit. So traffic regulation orders have to be done for every one of those roads. For every one of those roads you have to decide where you're going to put the 20 mile an hour repeater signs which are, are required. That requires administrative engineering work uh, and then outsourcing that engineering uh, work. You have to do the consultation which is appropriate for a traffic regulation order and if you're going to do a successful implementation of 20 mile an hour across all of those areas then you have to do the media, the social engagement, the education right, uh, uh, and so on which will make that uh, affected. So these are all the things which are imposed upon a local authority when you are putting in 20 miles an hour as an exception to the national norm. But when you change that national uh, norm, then this completely changes. Instead of having to do the traffic regulation orders on 80% of the roads, you're probably looking at 5% of the roads. Instead of looking at the signage on 80% of the roads, you're looking at perhaps 
5% of the roads. You're actually looking at what's the best mix of engagement and, and social media engagement and education between what the local authority does in terms right. of owning the communities owning those benefits and what is a national consensus that 20 mile an hour is the right a speed to do but, but when you're in the presence of people. Mr. King, that's changed the premise of the argument to go from a volume-based argument uh, rather than a process-led one. So the idea yeah. that the, 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 new, the new process will be more simple it is a different argument from saying that there, because there will be less of them required, it will therefore by default be easier. So it's not the process itself that's changing, it's just that you think that the volume will be different. Uh, the, the volume will be a very uh, different, but you won't be you won't be setting out to do exceptions to the national you'll warm, you'll well, you will be will going with the flow. You, no, but you will because if you want to go from a thirty to twenty, you're seeking exemption from the national, so you will still need to go through some form of exemption process, surely. So if you're going from thirty to twenty, yes. yes. So if, if the blanket is changed from thirty to twenty, yeah. and you want to make that road a thirty, as many local authorities may choose to do they will still have to go through an exemption process in the same way that they currently do. So I'm st I can't get my head around what's different. Well, the, yeah, technically there would be no uh, difference, but the, right. the volume in terms of the resources for the local authority would be hugely different. It's like 5% of roads instead of 80% of the roads. So, you know, that's a 16th of the, of, of the resources required. Which answers my original question. It's the process which is not changing, it's the volume that will change. I think you, you, you've made that comment, yeah. and, 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 and I do need to bring in some other members, Jamie, who, who are lining up. Richard Lowe, with a brief question. Yeah. A brief question. We're all talking about cars. What about buses? Buses run through housing estates. They do in my area. Through, uh, so you are now going to reduce... You're going to actually increase their... Uh, um, uh, the problem, make a problem for them for timetables. You're going to add to their time because they can't do 30 now, they can only do 20. Uh, and I've got other questions that will come on to that in a second. But So what happens to bus timetables? Does anyone specifically want to, to go with that? Rod, I'm, I'm conscious that you've been at the forefront of the argument. Um, uh, Adrian then, and, and then Gavin briefly. OK, I'll give you uh, a brief example from the city of Bristol, which I know in considerable detail. So the main operator is first in Bristol. They opposed the uh, 20 mile an hour programme when it originally started uh, with a pilot, just like Edinburgh. Uh, and then they did the analysis and they worked out that it wasn't the speed limit that was delaying them. It was the boarding of passengers and buying, buying tickets. They didn't have to change their timetable. Uh, the speed, the average speed issue is relatively small. There may be some need for some adjustment, but it's rather a small issue relative to often the way that people board buses and the delays that are there. And that's an issue about ticketing types. <laughs> Did you want to say something briefly? Briefly, that in areas where 20 mile an hour has been implemented, it has improved the flow of traffic. And so it's not necessarily true that while buses might be now travelling, their top speed might be lower, the overall journey time might not necessarily be um, longer. Uh, Mark Russell, you wanted to come in with a question, I assume. You don't want to answer something because you'll get a chance to answer that later. So no, it's a question I am. from you uh, to the panel. As I am. Um, so we have seen some uh, rollout of 20 mile an hour zones across Scotland um, in quite a, a, an inconsistent way. Um, if this bill didn't go through and we were to stick with the existing <coughs> system that we have, what, what do you think would be the progress that we could make uh, in, in Scotland under the existing system in terms of the rollout of 20 mile an hour? Um, who'd like to get... Bruce, would you like to say something on that or are you...? Uh, yeah... <laughs> I mean, as I've said earlier, I think uh, it's a piecemeal process just now that we're going through in Scotland. So if we think that uh, 30 mile per hour uh, limits on restricted roads in, in, in our towns and cities it is um, something we would like to change if we, if we want to have a, a lower speed limit to save lives, to get more people walking and cycling, feeling it safe for their children to walk and cycle to school, then doing it at a national basis would have a national public health impact and uh, Scotland could be in the forefront of, of another public health intervention, not unlike the impact of, of, of the smoking ban, for instance. I think it's, it's that large. 
Would anyone else like to come in briefly on that? Uh, Rod, uh, I think you were just be Adrian on the, the, the button. I, I think one reality which you would have to accept is that, uh, I mean, the Scottish Government is being posed this question, is what is the right speed limit for residential roads? And it's in a position to say whether it's 20 miles an hour or 30 miles an hour. If it decides against 20 miles an hour, then it is, in fact, endorsing 30 miles an hour on every restricted road which you have, unless a local authority thinks otherwise. So you will actually endorse a national consensus that it's OK to drive at 28, 29 miles per hour on those housing estates, those high streets, those places where people want to walk and cycle, with all the consequential effects uh, which w there will be, right, to en endorse that higher speed of driving. It will certainly have a negative effect as far as public health, as far as active travel is uh, uh, concerned, and the livability and, and well-being, I think, of Scottish <coughs> communities. Um, I'm, I'm happy to bring in Adrian, and then I'm afraid I'm going to have to go to the next question. Adrian, so if you okay, want to come so in very briefly. Right, quickly, yes, so it does reiterate what Rod said. So Scotland is a leading in many ways on the climate change uh, act and the bill that's before the parliament at the moment it has strong ambitions for physical activity and improving population health for increasing physical activity 20 miles an hour is necessary though it may be insufficient on its own there are other measures that need to go with it it's a great opportunity to move forward to help address many of the problems that scotland faces uh, it would be a missed opportunity but my last point is we know from the science it's very clear that higher speeds you're going to kill more people we have an opportunity to try to reduce the number of people who are killed and have life-changing injuries uh, and that's a big big opportunity for scotland okay which neatly brings us on to the next question from john finney John. Thank you, Convener. Hey, good morning, panel. Um, um, I, I had a, a question on road safety, and I know that you've all re referred to that in your submissions, and thank you very much for that. Um, I'm particularly drawn to um, Professor Adrian Davis' submission, where he talks in relation to the enhancement of road safety, um, and I quote here, Firstly, what is road safety? Road safety can be defined as, quote here, freedom from the liability of exposure to harm or injury on the highway. And you go on to say that this is in contrast to what's commonly been the misunderstood to be road safety. Um, and as researchers noted almost three decades ago, road safety usually means the unsafety of the road transport system. Now, um, I, forgive me again, just with another quote, it happens to be Professor Davis, road safety is more about the avoidance of being injured. It must be also address the perception of risk of harm and freedom from harm and its, uh, its manifestation at the individual community and societal levels. Um, can the panel outline uh, what they see as the road safety benefits accusing from the proposals in this bill, please? Um, and to give everyone a chance, uh, Adrian, I think you sort of almost started to answer that in the, the last question, so maybe I'll come to you last. Yeah. Would, would, it, would anyone else like to uh, kick off on that? Rod, do you, uh, do, you, do you want to outline some of the road safety benefits you feel? Briefly, if I may, so everyone else can come in. It, it, it is a problem, this. What do we mean by road safety? It means different <clears throat> things to different people. Uh, a community roads can be, become uh, a, a lot safer <coughs> if children don't walk and cycle to school. Uh, so does road safety include uh, the fears of a parent in allowing their child to walk or cycle to school? Uh, does road safety include the fears of a 75-year-old who normally walks to the shops once or twice a week but decides, you know, the, the speed of the traffic is such and me getting across the roads now uh, is, is such that uh, I don't think I can do uh, that anymore. Both of those decisions will reduce the casualty statistics on the roads because of those people choosing not to walk or cycle or go to the, the shops. So road safety has to be extended right beyond uh, that. It has to make communities and individuals feel more able to walk and cycle on their streets and lowering the speed of, of, of traffic uh, uh, does that. Right. So uh, I think, yes, on the wider aspects of road safety as well as the, the strict casualty uh, uh, aspects of it, uh, and widen it to emissions, which I'm sure Gavin will, will, will uh, address as well, it has huge benefits. Okay, uh, Stuart. Um, 
I think you have to look at what the best countries are doing in terms of road safety, and they take a safe systems approach, which says accidents will happen, mistakes will be made. What are the factors that deliver bad outcomes? And one of, the, uh, one of those factors is speed. So if you can el eliminate that as a factor, you will get better outcomes in terms of road safety. Scotland's trying to move in that direction. We're about to review our road safety framework. Now, at the moment, in terms of progress, it's been really good. But that progress is plateauing, and 20 mile an hour is one of the few big ticket items that we still have in the locker that we could deploy to bring those statistics down. And I think that's what we need to do as a nation. Uh, Bruce, and then I'll come back to Adrian. Um, I mean, we've all been involved in studies or quoted studies wh which have shown uh, reductions in road casualties uh, from 20 mile per hour limits. And there's various examples from Bristol, from the um, and other cities across the UK. What those statistics are based on is police recorded casualties, and we know they under record casualties. Uh, there's a recent paper by Rachel Aldridge which suggested that uh, um, the number of casualties on the roads was actually five times higher than police recorded casualties. So that gets into um, probably those were, were casualties, were maybe more minor casualties, might not have involved uh, all involved speeds, but, but uh, it gets to the point about safety and perception of safety on our streets uh, and if we feel that our streets are safer we are more likely to be out on those streets we're more likely to cycle on those streets we're more likely to allow our children to walk to school to cycle to school so i think in in some senses some of the estimates of the casualty reductions are are, are, are un, underestimate and, and get into this area of how do we become a, a more active nation as well uh, Adrian, I'm going to bring you in. Gavin, I'm not going to bring you in on this one because I think you'll be the first on the next one. I'm pretty sure you will be. Adrian. So, uh, briefly again, uh, to echo what Rod had, uh, King had mentioned. So, we've essentially, the, the point, the question from uh, Mr Finney was uh, really addressing road safety through fear. We just remove pedestrians and cyclists from the roads, which is what's happened increasingly over recent decades then you can, you can achieve your casualty reduction targets and traditional road safety practitioners will go, that's, that's fine, but it's not if we want to achieve the public important public health outcomes and hopefully address the climate target reductions that we need to have. And there's other aspects relating to social inclusion. Uh, and um, Stuart Hay mentioned about what we call community severance. People don't feel they're able to go out if you're in your 70s trying to get across the road when you can't get across the road because you're fearful for the environment out there that people are driving too fast and you're walking too slow. Um, there are a whole welter of benefits that come from slower speeds, which absolutely do include the casualty reduction and savings to the National Health Service and the, the misery and the suffering that come from that, but that goes well beyond the traditional road safety thing. It's about freedom from fear. OK, John. Thank you, Convener, and thank you, panel, for these answers. And, and some of you alluded to something that uh, in your replies there that also features in all your responses and is about active travel and the potential to, uh, for this. Uh, uh, 20s plenty for us. Uh, a quote from your, your good selves. Uh, Look at any city place that has successfully encouraged active travel and you will find low speed limits of 20 mph or 30 kilometres on most streets. Um, People would understand that uh, if people are confident to walk and uh, cycle in the streets that uh, there would be an increase. Is there any assessment being made uh, and, um, of that or are you able to quantify from experience elsewhere what any reduction would result in by way of increased active travel, please? Um, probably not you then, Gavin. Do you, do you want to lead on that? I'm happy to bring Rod and then bring you in on, on the back of it, if, if that's all right. Yeah. Rod, do you want to start off then on that? I think one of the issues is that 20 mile an hour isn't, isn't a silver bullet for active trouble. Sorry, I... It isn't a silver bullet for active trouble. No one actually uh, 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 expects a, a big change. But what it is, it's a foundation for active trouble. Right? And it provides a foundation for all those other initiatives which you're going to do on active travel, whether that be cycle training or whether it be making certain dangerous junctions better or, or, or maybe it's better uh, off-road cycle uh, paths, uh, better walking facilities, wider pavements or whatever. It's a foundation for all of these things. Uh, and, and that is what is happening when I said that those, if you have an approach 
to your community which says we'll make active travel easier, then 20 mile lamps is one of the things which you, which, which you do, right? Uh, so it, because it's never in isolation, that makes it a little bit to quantify, right, that, that difference in a, a, active travel, right? But Adrian will probably have more um, than that. I promised Gavin I'd let him in. Um, I, I'm going to be good to my promise, Gavin. Just checking my notes. So um, one study that looked at 20-mile-an-hour uh, zones in London um, that came out last year said 5% uh, of residents surveyed said they were walking more and 2% said they were cycling more. But I think within those um, stats, it's important to say that when you... or if we expand 20-mile-an-hour limits to be, as I mentioned earlier, the norm, then I think we can expect those figures to uh, rise as well, that um, creating behaviour changes about uh, people seeing it, uh, demonstrating it in their communities, and then um, gradually over time changing their travel choices. Breeze, you wanted to come in. Yeah, it was to give you a specific example. So prior to Edinburgh's uh, 20 mile per hour limit being brought in, there was a pilot in south central Edinburgh, which some people may be aware of, and there was before and after surveys of, of, of residents over a thousand households. So some of the stats from that are the proportion of children walking to school increased marginally from 63 to 65 percent. The proportion of older primary school allowed children allowed to play uh, unsupervised outside their home or on the pavement or on the street rose from 31% to 66%. Um, people considering how safe their street was increased from, 70, from 71% before to 78% afterwards. Uh, people considering traffic speeds in the local area to be safe uh, improved. The proportion of children cycling uh, to school increased from 4% before to 12% afterwards. And um, People who've overall support for the 20 mile per hour speed limit increased from 68% before to 79% after. So that's a specific example for South Central Edinburgh. Thank you. Okay, uh, John, are you? I, I'm concluded. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, the next question then is from Richard Lau. Richard. Yeah, okay, gentlemen. Um, no one can dispute that reducing, you know, in this room, that reducing this, uh, uh, the speed limit uh, help. Uh, will improve and, and we know that, that speed kills. So basically uh, that, that's accepted. And a point can I clarify to Mr King, you were talking about um, we don't know where speed, what speed limit is in a particular road. Most new cars now actually have it on the dash that it comes up. You're in a 30 zone, you're in a 40 zone. So uh, I'll just put that on the table. Anyway, um, the committee, a committee recently done a piece of work on air pollution in this parliament. Air quality is important to people. Um, living streets, Mr Hay, you said evidence in carbon reduction and air pollution is mixed and inconclusive. Uh, Mr Gavin Thompson from Friends of the Earth Scotland said reducing the speed limit would improve the flow of traffic, reduce congestion and emissions. But the RAC, who are what they call the motorist friend, say the potential impact on urban congestion from reduced speeds and the eventual uh, longer journey times may increase emissions. So what, would, what impact would you expect the reduction and default speed limit on restricted roads to 20 miles an hour to have on vehicle emissions and local air pollution? And can you highlight any relevant research in this area that may be of interest to the committee? So I'm going to let Gavin go, followed by Stuart Hay, as you were both uh, organisations Great. quoted. Thanks very much. Um, OK, so uh, I'll get on to the research. But um, So as I mentioned earlier, the evidence base suggests that 20 mile an hour uh, limits improve traffic flow. But importantly, from an air pollution point of view, you have less stop start, you have less acceleration and deceleration, which means less particulate pollution. These are tiny particles which you breathe in and cause a lot of damage. A lot of the work we do on air pollution is about particulate matter. Um, and so when you have less uh, acceleration, deceleration, less stop start of traffic, you get a lot less particulate pollution and improving the air quality uh, from traffic. But I think uh, there's also studies, um, so I would point to the Transport and Environmental Analysis Group in 2013, which showed the reduction in NOx from 20 mile an hour drive cycles. Um, and the evidence on PM10 is a bit more mixed. Um, 
And I would also point to uh, a 2017 study which looked at 20 mile an hour speed limits in Wales. Um, and that one draws out the, uh, that the improving traffic flow leads to uh, decreased uh, particulate pollution, and uh, in other words, decreased air pollution. Okay, uh, Stuart. Like Edinburgh as a, a good example. So we've, we've now got a 20 mile an hour, and I, I don't think there's been any real problem with air pollution getting worse. I think I believe the still is gradually improving, and, and 20 mile an hour has not affected that. And I think looking in the future, one of the main sources of air pollution will be particulates from braking. Now, at 20 mile an hour, you're not braking as hard, so we're going to start to bring down particulates. We're going to see, see that, and the type of vehicle is, is increasingly going to be hybrids which run at, lower, uh, run at lower speeds, so there'll be less emissions from them. So I think in the future, the prospects of 20 mile an hour working in uh, complement, or complement, complementing uh, air quality uh, is really going to work. I, I think just, there's just not that many studies that have been done on that, and we shouldn't assume that it will be worse, because it's, it's about how people drive their vehicles. Um, Mike, you wanted to come in with a supplementary, and then I'll come back to you, Richard. On this very point, thank you, Convener. And both Stuart and Gavin have talked about, quite rightly, particulate emissions um, being better with 20 mile an hour. But most people think think uh, of exhausts, particularly. Uh, and in the briefing we've been given by Spice, it says detailed research, detailed research conducted by the Corporation of the City of London, concluded that exhaust emissions are broadly similar with either a 30-mile limit or a 20-mile limit. Any, any comment on that? Gavin, do you want to come in? And then I'll bring in you, Rod. Yeah, um, yeah I'm familiar with this study cited, and it, it does point to um, the evidence being a bit mixed between 20-mile-an-hour uh, and 30-mile-an-hour, and it depends on uh, the car and petrol and diesel. But I think one of the things we would stress is, um, in drawing out from those answers is that that it doesn't necessarily relate to the driving styles which change when the speed limit changes. That's, um, I think that study is based on drive cycle exhaust emissions, uh, which is more uh, laboratory testing. But that uh, when the speed limit is reduced, and so the driving patterns tend to change and you have less accelerations and decelerations, less fuel consumption, which impacts on uh, exhaust emissions as well. Rod, you want to? Yeah, I, I think the, the background is most fuel consumption and emissions is actually through acceleration and de acceleration and, and replacing deceleration, mm. if you like. Uh, at, uh, at a constant 20 mile an hour, most vehicles will get a nine, about 90 miles per gallon, which tells you how much fuel they're using at that steady uh, state. What the uh, um, Imperial College London report actually showed that it was mixed because <laughs> Uh, if, if you look at petrol uh, uh, cars, there was a, a, a slight increase in NOx and PM10 emissions, but in diesel cars, there was a slight decrease in NOx and PM10 uh, emissions. But the point is that for diesel vehicles, the NOx and PM10 emissions <coughs> are 10 times higher than petrol cars. And therefore, the 8% savings which you get on the 10 times of the diesel emissions were very beneficial con compared to the slight uh, reduction, which uh, slight increase which you got on the, on the petrol engine. We calculated that, that actually, based on those results going to uh, 20 mile an hour, is the equivalent reduction in emissions given the mix of diesel and petrol vehicles on the road to taking half the petrol cars off the road completely, which gives you an idea that you will get uh, a, a reduction in emissions. But the very important thing which the report said categorically was that there would be no increase in emissions from moving to 20 mile an hour limits. Peter, you wanted to come in and then I'll come to you, Adrian. Uh, just on, the, on this fuel consumption thing, a, a, a car, a modern car travelling at an, an average, at a steady 30 miles per hour will use less fuel than a, than a modern car running at 20 miles per hour. I mean, that, that's just a given fact. I'm sure that's correct. I think I've seen figures of something like 10% fuel consumption, 10% higher at a steady 20 as compared to a steady 30. Because you're in a lower gear, obviously you're in a lower gear. Does anyone want to come? Uh, Rod, do you want to come back? Uh, well, I did promise Adrian, actually, so I'll be in trouble if I don't. And I don't want to break the flow of it because my point is about social norms, which I'd like to just bring in. Rod, if you want to come back on that and then I'll bring Adrian in. 
Uh, yeah, um, I've got a degree in automobile engineering, so I always enjoy these questions. Uh, um, really, tests have been showed that for, for most cars, it's all dependent upon the gearing, whether there will be a difference uh, between 30 or 20 miles an hour steady speed fuel consumption, right? But it, it is marginal the di difference. And my point about with the 90 miles per, ga per gallon is none of us get 90 miles per gallon from our from our, our, our cars because most of the fuel which we used is not in just keep going at the same speed. It's it, it's actually when we're accelerating and, uh, and decelerating. So the actual slight variation between the steady state fuel consumption at 20 or 30 is, is not pertinent at all, right, to, uh, I, I, I think, to the, to the emission uh, effect that which there will be, mm. uh, which will really come from taking out all of that acceleration from 20 to 30. And bear in mind, you use twice as much energy to get 30 to 30 than you do to get to 20. Did, did you want to come in briefly there? I, I appreciate that, convener. Thank you very much. And I should declare an interest as I'm co-convener of the cross-party group for cycling, walking and buses. Um, and I'd just like to ask any of the panel members who feel it's appropriate to answer about um, their view on the impact of what I understand could be more active travel on um, emissions, whether those are um, air pollution emissions or indeed um, greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you. A Adrian, I've, I've, I've stopped you so far. It's your turn. I have a, quick, a point about social norms to make, if we can fit it in, but um, very, very much to uh, your point um, about emissions. So emissions is a really interesting area where there is a disconnect between public understanding and, and the science. So studies time and again across uh, certainly European studies uh, have, have shown that often, particularly in urban environments where the intensity of the pollution is greatest, uh, the pollution is concentrated inside vehicles, which is a really interesting uh, a point which I think you have to unpack because of the lack of understanding of that. People think they're protected in their new cars when they're not. The, the fall away of the drop, dropping of the pollution is quite significant once you move away from the, the centre of the carriageway, which is where the peak of the pollution is. So uh, pedestrians get least pollution, cyclists get a bit more, but it's it, the, in vehicle, in urban areas, where m most of the pollution is, and, and that's, that's an interesting point about lack of knowledge of it. And, and as I say, the fall away is quite significant to the point of trying to describe that to someone. If you're on the top deck of a bus, you're getting less pollution than someone sitting on the lower deck of the bus. That's the point about how fast it falls away. But it is a serious issue in terms of exposure. And so for, for the active travellers, they're still getting the pollution, but the science is very clear that the cardiovascular benefits of being physically active as well as mental health and wellbeing stuff. Uh, is much more much more significant than the risk uh, of the pollution to to your health, and that has been studied uh, many times now in in the peer reviewed literature. Uh, Richard, I'm going to come back to you for a follow up and and then move on. You know, can the panel set out why you think, given uncertainty about emissions, impact of the what the impact of a proposed 20 mile an hour speed limit, uh, what benefits? Do these benefits outweigh concerns about air pollution? And do you honestly, seriously all think that a 20 mile an hour uh, speed limit would improve traffic flow? Do you? Um, right, and Rich, Richard, you're going to have to apologise to Jamie Green later for taking his question, but we'll go right down the line, if we may. No, Rod King on that. Rod, do you want to start off on that? Well, it, it will certainly re reduce emissions. I think the, uh, I'll be fairly sure of uh, saying that. And there is, uh, uh, there is a evidence that when you uh, reduce speeds and control speeds rather than be them uh, uh, being a, a, a free-for-all, then you'll actually get more traffic through. And I think the, I, I've read that the ideal speed is actually 17 miles per hour uh, in... Uh, networks where you have a, a lot of junctions of incoming traffic and uh, uh, and so on, and of course it's it's well known in uh, in circles such as the M25. If you want to get more traffic on it, then you actually uh, reduce the speed because that allows you to to get more uh, through flow by reducing 
the speed. Right, so in where well, you do have congested conditions, reducing the speed does actually enable you to get more through, through flow. Right. I think we need to consider that one of the biggest barriers to walking and cycling is perceptions of safety. And if you improve people's perceptions of safety, they'll walk and cycle more, they'll drive less, you'll have fewer cars on the road. The, the, the cars that remain will be more efficient. Um, because there's fewer of them, there's le less less congestion. So you get a virtuous circle, but you don't get that virtuous circle unless you can change perception of safety. And to do that, you need the 20 mile an hour to begin with. Adrian. So I think we should try to keep in our minds that this is a road safety intervention, but it's also a behaviour change intervention. And behaviour change, human beings do not like changing their behaviour. Um, so it will take time. Uh, and it will take time to create a new social norm. But that is what I think will happen over, over time. We've seen it with drink drive. So drink drive was perfectly acceptable in the 70s. And we've new, moved to a position that so it is now you're a social outcast if you drink and drive. Uh, and we have to do that with things like speed as well. So it's no longer acceptable for people to be uh, seen and known to have uh, a bit to break speed limits. So we can create a social norm, and that does ask one of the questions that was put to in the consultation about changing um, how, how we achieve 20 miles now, that it does require uh, some enforcement, and it does require some uh, campaign activities, which I would label as social marketing. Um, and if we do that, as uh, Stuart Hay said, we get the mode shift that we want, which releases the public health benefits. Bruce, briefly. Please. Yeah, I'd take this back to safety to start off with. NICE, the WHO, the OECD, the Faculty of Public Health all support 30 kilometres per hour or, or equivalent to 20 miles per hour, slightly less, as a safe speed in urban roads, particularly where there could be conflict between cars and walkers and cyclists and other vulnerable road users. And NICE also publishes guidance in air pollution, uh, and they're in, the, in that guidance they strongly support 20 mile per hour limits for smooth driving and speed reduction. Gavin, briefly, if I may entice you. Yeah, so just briefly, well, the um, picture for exhaust emissions um, from changing 30 mile an hour to 20 mile an hour might be mixed or have a degree of nuance. When we look at air pollution as a whole, including tyre wear and brake wear, it's pretty clear that 20 mile an hour limits would improve air quality. And then just finally on the question of traffic flow, I'm only going on the evidence base that's pretty clear that um, 20 mile an hour or 30 uh, kilometres an hour equivalent um, reduces idle times and gear changing um, and the accelerations and decelerations which we've discussed. Okay, I'm afraid we're going to have to move on to the next question, which is Maureen. Um, thank you, convener. Um, can I move on to the social benefits? Um, comments in written evidence uh, about the reduction on restricted roads to 20 miles an hour increase the livability of neighbourhoods, um, particularly for residents and local businesses. Can you maybe expand on what that means? I mean, does it mean that children are going to be playing football across the, the road or...? What exactly does it mean? I, I mean, I'm all for residents and pedestrians reclaiming streets, but what exactly are the social benefits and what tangible differences are we going to see in our streets? I'm going to start off with you, Stuart. Hey, that seems to be your uh, area. I, I think well, 20 mile an hour is part of a, a wider picture on how we change, change the streets. It's an essential ingredient in that, that the feel of our streets changes, that people are happier to spend more time in them, especially sort of town centres, for, for instance. There's not as much traffic noise. There's not as much perception of danger from, the, from that side of things. I think we have some way to go before we'll see kids playing in the streets. I, I don't think 20 mile an hour on, a, on its own will do that, but I think it's a step towards that. And I'm going to bring you in, Rod, and then I am going to have to go to the next question, I'm afraid. Yeah, I, I think it's important because what we're talking about is these public spaces between buildings, which we call streets. And we mustn't forget that they are uh, public uh, uh, spaces. There is some very clear evidence from uh, 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 Apple Yard uh, uh, in America, Josh Hart in, uh, uh, in, in Bristol, around the community cohesiveness and communications which there are and how dependent they are on the traffic conditions, on the road which separates right, uh, those, the, the, those, those people 
and affects their ability to make visits to neighbours, to, to, to actually walk to the, to, to the shops and actually be in that communi communi community uh, as a person. You know? and, and the point is that when you walk, you talk with people. And so this does have a, a, a very uh, beneficial uh, change in that, that cohesiveness and pe how people feel uh, about the community. The Upper Yard report, uh, 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 research showed quite clearly that where you had increased traffic, you had reduced communication between neighbours and that collective feeling uh, uh, about being a, a community. So get those speeds lower, do something which is symbolic about making communities better, and that will, will help. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to the next question, which is from the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. Gail. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, I have two areas that I'd like to cover, but I've been told I need to roll it into one question to save time. So apologies, it might be a long question. Um, it's about awareness raising and enforcement. So we've had some evidence in to say um, about it, the... the Awareness uh, should be along the terms of the drink driving campaign, the um, <clears throat> social stigma, things like that. Obviously, there's the safety aspect and the environmental aspect as well. So um, what form do you think the awareness campaign should take? Um, and it's, for the enforcement side, um, obviously, well, not obviously, but maybe you're going to get people that will say, I wasn't aware. Um, and we have the implementation period as well to allow local authorities to get the signs in place. Um, how do you think that the police should handle these instances if they should arise um, during that period or indeed after the implementation period? So I'm not sure how strictly the police are enforcing the 20 mile an hour speed limit around Edinburgh, but maybe you'd like to bring that into the... Who'd like to uh, kick off on that? Uh, Rod? Perhaps I'll... I'll cover the enforcement. We can look at best practice around the UK and, and we can look at worst practice as well. Right? And uh, the worst practice is for the Chief Constable to say we're not going to enforce 20 mile an hour limits because then you, you, you send out a huge message to non-compliers that, that, that A, they're not going to court, get caught, but this isn't a proper speed limit uh, anyway. Uh, so I think the, the level beyond that, which is worst practice, is to actually uh, do some enforcement, right? Or actually, be, so that this is seen as a speed limit just like any other. And you know, we, it, it could be, we could be any road anywhere, right? We could be enforcing the limit, whatever it is. And then we see best practice, which there is in places like Avon and Somerset Police, where the, first of all, they have speed awareness courses, on 20 mile an hour, which means uh, that when they actually uh, do put people on a speed awareness course, they get an administrative fee back from the, from the course attendee, which help pays for the, uh, the enforcement process. They also publish where their speed camera sites are going to be each, each week, and that comprises 20 mile an hour and 30 mile an hour sites and 40 mile an hour sites. So again, spreading that, that consensus that actually 20 mile an hour limits are being enforced just like any uh, uh, others. So it's not a case of having a policeman around every corner, right? But it's about establishing that as what I would say is beyond the social consensus, it's an establishment consensus as well, right? That 20 mile an hour is a legal limit. And you know, if you get caught, you will be uh, a face a, a restriction, whether that's a, 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 a course or it's actually a, a fixed penalty uh, notice. So uh, that's the experience which, which we have. Sorry, can I just clarify, Rod, are you, are you suggesting that speed awareness courses, because they're not in Scotland at the moment, are they? You're suggesting that that would be good practice, is, is that right? I'm saying that's a, that, that's a, a method which is used in, 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 in some places in, in England in order to, A, uh, provide a, a, a restriction on someone without necessarily giving them points on their, on their licence if it's a, a, a appropriate, right? So, yes, it, it, it can be done. The other option which there is, is there is the ability for the police to delegate responsibilities for enforcement to local authorities or other agencies and that's been explored in some areas and until you said yes there I thought you were going to give a politician's answer Adrian um, 
uh, 20 miles an hour being a behaviour change intervention as well as a road safety intervention. So one of the examples, and thinking about um, the drink drive example of think that's been running for a long, uh, for decades now, in terms of uh, trying to relieve the scourge of drink driving. Um, so West Midlands Police Force is a really good example. I did cite it in my written evidence um, that with a relatively small force, they are, by their tactics, able to make quite a big lot of noise. And they deliberately go out to make a bit of a, a lot of noise in communities. They will often go around school areas and, and other population specific settings. And they will go and deliberately book people for speeding and other, other infringements. They will, in the case of a school, tell the head teacher and ask them to put it out through their social media networks. And then they'll create a dialogue, create quite a bit of noise uh, from people who say you should be out there catching real criminals, etc. Uh, and they'll come back and explain why, exactly why, you are a criminal in the way the action you have uh, been caught for. Uh, and that creates a consensus that the police are out there. Uh, and it means within the... the uh, level of uh, capacity that the police has, they can create quite a lot of uh, impression There's a, that you will be caught uh, if you're going to speed. Now, we do need more police, and sport, uh, police enforcement, but I think there is a bigger discussion for probably longer than this session about an, a national awareness campaign and the constituent ingredients of that, which I've mentioned before, need to have a strong social marking element about what you gain from what we take away. If we're taking away your right to go to 30, but to be at 20, there's a lot of benefits which we've talked about that are there. And we do know that most of the population in consistent studies across the UK from the British Social Attitude Survey, etc., show we have a clear majority support for 20 miles an hour. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll move on to the next question, if I may, which is uh, John Mason. John. Uh, thanks very much, convener. Um, I mean, I'm interested in the financial memorandum and some of the costs of all this, uh, and I realise that may not always be people's speciality subject, but um, it does, I think, relate back, especially to some of the questions Mike Rumbles was asking, uh, because I think there's a, a, a kind of interconnection there. Uh, I mean, the, the financial memorandum specifically mentions Angus, and I had a quick look at Brechin, and so you've got, I think it's the A935 runs through that town, and as things stand, it would be at 30 and I, I counted on Google at least 40 side roads there that would all need a 20 zone and a 30 roundel uh, in and out. So there's a considerable cost to that, and the council has, has made an estimate of that. I mean, it would be cheaper, presumably, just to have 20s all round the town, and every road in the town s stays at 20. And, and in many ways, that would be simpler for people to understand. And the child who's playing in one street doesn't know that the next street is a different speed limit. So, A, a I mean, would, would that be cheaper, do you think, to implement and get people to understand and all the rest of it? Um, and B, I mean, why is it only restricted roads we're looking at for 20? Who'd like to head off on that? Stuart. I think there's, there's no reason why we shouldn't be looking at the trunk road network in terms of bring some of these streets, these high streets that are part of the trunk road network down to 20 mile an hour. And to be honest, Transport Scotland have attempted to do that. And one of the challenges they've faced is the fact that the local authority then has to bring down all these side streets. So it's kind of the, the problem's almost reversed at the moment. So if they can work together, we can do this cheaply. Uh, and that's the whole point. And I think it's not a change of policy and exactly for, 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 for Transport Scotland. So I think your point's a valid one that we can make. This, this overall should be a cheaper approach than taking out all these different orders and we should end up with less signs rather than more signs <laughs> if, we plan, if we plan this out on a network basis as a, as, as a national programme. And I should say, as a, as a national speed limit, I think there is a bit of an onus on the national government to bear some of the costs as a national initiative. I mean, would, um, just uh, to be devil's advocate to my own point, I mean, would, would industry, would the transport industry be very opposed to 20 zones through, on, on major routes through small towns? I, I would say that these are relatively short sections of road, and it has been done before, so this isn't new. It's just, it's just been technically difficult to do it. There is actually support in communities to, to do this. And the average speeds... On some of these streets, where you've, you're shopping streets, you've got loading, you've got you've got pedestrian crossings and stuff that will, will not be particularly high 
most of the time. So the, 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 the impacts on business are probably going to be pretty marginal. Uh, Mr King. Yeah. I think the, the beauty of this bill is, is, is it probably does it at the optimum level. Right, and, and the optimum level is to say we'll address the restricted roads and leave, leave the A, B and uh, uh, roads to local authorities to decide because that gives you that flexibility which you, you need. It's, uh, if, if like, national consistency combined with, with local flexibility. And I think that's what's really good uh, uh, about the, uh, uh, the bill. I think it would have been the other way around and the bill had said we're going to change all roads which are within urban environments or village environments to 20 miles an hour, then you would have had separate questions being asked about uh, w whether that was appropriate. I think this gets a fine balance between the two, and I commend it uh, for that. OK, that's fine. I mean, I think I'll probably ask Mr Ruskell when he comes as a witness to the committee uh, on that point and follow that up. Just another one on cost, if I may. Um, there's there's a, between one and two million in the uh, financial memorandum for removing repeater signs. Because as I understand it, the present regulations say that whatever the default speed limit is, you can't have repeater signs. But if it's not the default, so it could be 20, could be 40 at the moment, then you have to have the repeater signs. Now, I actually think, and my community councils in my area are often asking for repeater signs. I've got a new road in my area called Clyde Gateway, which is a dual carriageway. Big sweeping road, looks like, feels like it should be a 40 or 50, but it's actually a 30. People have asked for repeater signs. The council says it can't put in repeater signs. So, I mean, A, should we change that rule about repeater signs? And, well, again, B, that would save us quite a lot of money because could, Edinburgh could leave them all up. So, uh, I'm not sure, John, if you're suggesting that you become a middleman for Edinburgh to, to sell on them <laughs> a repeater signs. <laughs> but if somebody would like to come, to, to come back on that, who'd like to come back on that? Uh, Rod, briefly, if you um, th th These are technical issues about the uh, traffic signage regulations in general directive, right, which is different from the, the actual guidance on setting speed limits and, uh, uh, and so on. Yes. And there's been numerous changes in that over the years as, uh, 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 as well, right. Uh, the situation is that r repeater signs are currently required if you're not got the national yes. speed limit. Yes. So if the national speed <coughs> limit changes, then you, uh, you wouldn't need the 20 mile an hour repeater signs, but you would actually for those dual carriageway 30 mile an hour roads, yes. which are actually no longer the uh, national mm. uh, 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 speed limit. But I think there are opportunities in there because the, the traffic, the TSRGD has relaxed it and now it's under the discretion of the local authority how many repeater signs it, it has. Right. So I've How many it has or whether it has them or not? Uh, or both? It needs at least one in an area. It's, it's very obscure, right, okay. right, because it needs one in an area, but it doesn't necessarily say how many you need as long as drivers know what the speed limit is. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that, that's the criteria. I would say that in other countries, they don't have repeater signs. Again, it's a particular UK phenomena, mm -hmm. right, that we want to keep on reminding drivers because they aren't smart enough to know, well, look, it's, it's a 30 mile an hour limit here or a 20 mile an hour uh, limit. But, but so, this is going to complicate it, isn't it? Because, I mean, at the moment, if you're in Glasgow, you assume you're a 30. But in future, under the, this plan, there will be some more confusion because some roads will be 30 and some roads will be 20. Well, there can be simplification because if you actually look at changing the TSRGD, which you will have to, because in some places the TSRGD refers to um, not having repeater signs on 30 mile an hour roads and it conflates that with, with national speed <laughs> limit uh, roads. So there will be some changes in that required anyway. Okay. And that would allow you to say that where you have 20 or 30 mile an hour roads, it doesn't matter if you have 20 mile an hour repeater signs, you can leave them in. So that is something which could be worked out in the, in the detail okay. and right. be addressed by a statutory instrument rather mm -hmm. than necessarily in legislation. I accept that, right, that's, that's great. John, Thanks. I'm gonna bring in one or two other yes, people please. and maybe come back to you if you finish. Colin, you want to come in briefly? The current budget going through Parliament at the moment, um, COSLA say, is a £147 million 
cash cut for local authorities. The Scottish Parliament's Information Centre says it's a, a £230 million real terms cut for local authorities. Nobody believes the government are going to hand local authorities an extra £20 million to pay for this. So do you think it's fair to ask local authorities to pick up the bill for this? Is that their priority, playing devil's advocate? Uh, what do you think should be cut? And do you think this is the most effective road safety investment that local authorities could have? Um, gosh, quite a subjective comment there. Adrian, do you want to come in? I'm going to try and answer Mr Smith's uh, 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 question there. So in terms of most effective intervention, we've already had a, a debate in the wider literature that, uh, yes, it looks like it is one of the most effective interventions that we, we could choose to try to reduce casualties in terms of cost of the nation. I'll just remind you at a kind of a, a parliament level or a national level to think about the value of a statistical life is over £1.8 million. Pounds. So if you kill someone on the road, that's a crude assessment, of course. It doesn't include the, the misery and loss and all the things that are not easily quantifiable. So there are some big, big savings to have for the National Health Service. And there is a question, I think, that needs to be discussed at the national level about if there are savings that we can estimate from the studies that have already gone on to the National Health Service, is there money that can be uh, uh, crossed over to help the implementation uh, of 20 miles an hour uh, program from what was NHS budgets. I know my NHS uh, director college would not like to hear that, but it's a, it's a viable issue in terms of a question that should be asked. Bruce. Uh, I'm going to duck the answer about uh, the, the question about who should pay for this, but I, I would point out that uh, it's clear that it will be upfront costs in, in terms of more, more signage being needed and changes to signage. But over the piece, if we see reductions in casualties uh, that we might expect, we're going to see that year on year, year after year, and th there's a long-term benefit to well, to savings in terms of casualties and fatalities, but also some of the public health benefits in terms of having a, a slightly more active population. This is a, an intervention that is not the only thing that we need to improve physical activity and health in Scotland, but it will help alongside uh, other, uh, and it will, it will help uh, where we're building uh, pedestrianised areas, where we're building uh, segregated cycle routes for people to think it's safe to use them as well. So it will be more effective for the, it will, it will help the effectiveness of some of these other schemes. Okay. Maureen, did you want to come in with a question? Yes, it says uh, on uh, the financial memorandum that the co annual cost in the first two years to local authorities will be 9 to 10 million. In its submission, Aberdeenshire Council, and I represent part of Aberdeenshire, uh, says it will cost them half a million. So half a million times 32 local authorities is 16 million. Is this figure not grossly underestimated? And where did it come from? Stuart, do you want to, to go on that? I didn't prepare that figure, but what, what I can say is that, that this will affect different local authorities differently, depending on what level of progress they've already made on 20 mile an hour. Uh, some local authorities will see a saving if they have a programme already, such as Glasgow, where they're rolling this out. They can do that more cheaply and more, more efficiently. For local authorities that haven't done anything or have a very small network, it is going to cost them a lot more money uh, in the short term uh, to do this. But even they, they, would, they would benefit because this is the cheapest and most efficient way of rolling out the, the limit. And I, I would actually say I think national government does need to stump up and does need to contribute as a national initiative that will d deliver national benefits if they want to deliver the road safety framework. There isn't a lot of le things left in the locker. This is one of the cost effective op options that is there for, for them to tap into. I mean, in, in rural constituencies where there are lots of trunk roads, I mean, it, 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 it's going to be a big problem, I, th I think, that you're indicating. Jamie, you wanted to come in briefly. Thank you. And this is following on from Maureen Watt's line of questioning. Uh, I've had uh, very specific conversations with many local authorities about this, amongst other transport issues, and they are uh, grossly concerned about the potential costs of this. Um, in the financial memorandum, it, it does actually state that some of the total costs of this will be offset by fine income. Now, I think that's a, a very odd stance to take because we don't know what the fine income will be. And it's also uh, predicated on the fact that we're assuming people are going to break the law. It's not an entirely positive view uh, on, on the bill. So I, I, how can we actually come up with a, a, 
a, a proper conjecture as to the cost of this to local authorities and other agencies, including the courts and the government and the Crown Office and the police, which we haven't taken into account either. Surely we should be able to come up with a, a, a total figure on this to give us a scale of it. I, I, I tell you what, I think this may be a question that, that the member will have to answer when he brings his bill forward, but I'm happy to bring in Rod very briefly if you want to come in, yeah. and then I'm afraid we're going to have to draw this to a close because yeah. we're very short of time. I, I think some of these are in the detail and we'll will get resolved. It's only when local authorities start to look at it and actually start to exercise their options and say, well, will we keep that main road at 30 or will we make it 20 as, as, uh, as well, right? So I think that's for questions which are further down the, the line, right, than perhaps where you are uh, now. Uh, certainly when we look at it from UK implementation today, we're talking about three to four pounds per head of population for implementing authority-wide 20 mile an hour limits. Uh, and that seen as very good value. You've got a great opportunity to load that to national government as well as, as, as local government and make efficiency savings by doing that in a, a national and coordinated way. So I think that's a very positive opportunity to get the best value for money right, from what is recognised as the right thing to do. Uh, and I think that's probably a, a good place just to, to stop at on the basis that members will get the opportunity to talk to uh, local authorities and also the police as part of the evidence session. So we probably come to the end of this session. I'd like to thank all the panel members for, for coming and I hope you all got a chance to put your points of view across. And uh, I'm now going to suspend the meeting for five minutes. Uh, uh, I, I failed to include in my declaration my membership of the Institute of Advanced Motorists. Okay. Thank you. Uh, um, so, sorry, therefore, now we've had that declaration, I'm now going to suspend the meeting for five minutes. I would ask members to be back here at 11.47, please.
going to move back into a uh, formal session and to move to agenda item five, which is on the transport bill and is headed recent developments. The committee will have had an, uh, an amendment to the agenda, uh, which was put out yesterday afternoon to allow this matter to be discussed. I wanted to bring it to the committee's attention uh, that I had a meeting with the Minister for Parliamentary Business last Thursday at his request. And the Minister at that meeting proposed that stage two of the transport bill be delayed. Those of you that will remember, it was originally pencilled in uh, for late March or April. At this stage, um, we do not know uh, what that delay is going to be. And this delay was partly uh, on resource capacity within the Scottish Government and partly on the announcement that very afternoon that the Scottish Government will bring forward an amendment to the bill at stage two to introduce a working, parking, uh, working place parking levy. And at this stage, I think it's probably appropriate to bring in uh, John Finney, who, who'd like to say something. John. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, yes, I, I, just to confirm that I, I did contact yourself and the clerk to advise that it's, in fact, myself that will bring forward the workplace parking levy. And the Scottish Government have indicated that they will support that. So. It really is, is, is a courtesy to say that in advance, but also to, to suggest, and particularly this is, I, I think, pertinent given the, the adjust time frame, which I, I assume has nothing to do with this, but that this might afford the um, committee the opportunity to take, take some evidence in this. Certainly, I would be very uh, keen to, to, to make available the, the wording of the amendment to facilitate that and perhaps some discussion. I think that might be helpful. Okay, John, uh, thank you for that. I mean, I have a, a, a couple of questions because this is, I think, would be classed as a, an evolving uh, situation uh, and we're, there are different bits of information coming from different levels. So I think from the committee's point of view, and I think that the discussion that we, we, we should have is about the process of this rather than the actual, the merits of this system. So to work out how we're going to manage it as a committee to take it forward. Um, my, my question, a couple of questions if I may to you, John, is will, will you be taking some uh, uh, or consulting on the, uh, on the proposal that you're bringing forward at, at stage two? Will you uh, consult before you bring that proposal forward? Um, it's not my intention to formally consult. There has been en engagement with local authorities and, and, and others, but not, not in a formal capacity. And I, I thought that would afford the, the committee the opportunity to, okay. to, to do that level of scrutiny. OK. And on that basis, I mean, uh, as far as the, the committee is concerned, if we are going to consult on it, which will be a matter for the committee to decide whether that's appropriate, um, I, th I believe the committee would welcome... Uh, sight of any proposed amendment at the first possible opportunity so that any consultation, if we were to carry it out, were, was, was done with that in mind. Um, I'm happy to make that uh, available, perhaps with some background papers. Um, OK. Um, I, I actually have some questions now from other members of the committee who've indicated they'd like to say something. There's a few of them lining up. Mike Rumbles was first. Yeah, yeah th thanks, Convener, and, and, and thank you, John. You've answered some of the questions that I was uh, going to ask. It was my understanding that it was going to be a Green member such as yourself to, to bring forward the amendment uh, and that the Scottish Government wasn't bringing an amendment themselves. I, I, I understood that was the case, and it's good to have it confirmed now, formally. Mm. So, really, I know John is saying he'll bring it as soon as he can, but it would be helpful to know when he thinks a date might be available when we could get sight of, of his proposed amendment. And I think then it's essential that we consult on it, that we hear people's views on it, as we would do in the normal process of, of, of a stage one, and then take evidence on it. Um, so I think that's the process that we need to be involved in. OK. Um, uh, John, do you want to say anything to that? I mean, I think... That... It, well, it, members will be aware that this became part of the negotiations um, regarding the draft budget. I have to say that, completely uh, independent of that, I would have been bring, bringing forward this anyway. Um, um, but um, I clearly would have done so, um, you know, knowing some people's views, but not necessarily formally initiating any consultation, as anyone would do. So th this, if you like, this amendment, which ordinarily would have brought, been brought here as any member can bring an amendment to stage two, has, has uh, um, developed a, a status that maybe it wouldn't ordinarily have had had I just brought it. Okay. Uh, Colin, you want to say something? 
I mean, I think it's fair to say this is a, a very material change, a proposed change to the Transport Bill, uh, and it would be very unfair, having gone through quite a detailed consultation process for Stage 1 and allowed so many organisations to comment on the Bill, if we didn't do exactly the same process for something as, as major a change as this. Uh, and I think it's important to do that. I think what's unclear, unfortunately, is we don't know what the timescale is yet for the Stage 2 process, um, based on your comments, convener, that, that the government don't know what that timescale actually is. So are we going to have sufficient time in order to carry out that process? I think it's only fair that we do carry out that, that process. Okay, um, Richard, I'm just going to sort of store them up and try and answer the questions as, as we get, get to the end, to try and distill them down. Richard, yeah. Yeah, thank, um, from a previous committee uh, on a, one of the people who gave it evidence during the Transport Bill, everyone knows my view on the workplace park and levy. Uh, well, I, I at that time uh, said I was against it. Um, it's interesting that basically, based on the, the Greens are bring, bringing this forward, I'd like one question a, uh, answered, if possible, uh, Mr Finney, since you're going to bring this. Uh, the workplace parking levy, will it be levied on companies or will it be levied on employees? I'd be interested R to know. R Richard, Richard, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I did say at the beginning, and I, I'd like to try and stick to it without upsetting every member of the committee, that I don't want to get into the policy discussion. I'd like to discuss how the committee would like to handle this oh. and, and the consultation and the evidence that we're way. taking. So if you I could ask me you... After. If I could ask you, uh, to, with a smile on my face, to part that question and ask it later, I, I'd appreciate it. Um, John, you had a question, and then Maureen. Yes, well, I think actually, um, largely agreeing with Colin's point. Um, I mean, I think, I, I think on the whole, we've got a good process here for legislation, but I think one of the weaknesses can be that a major amendment appears either at stage two or stage three and isn't consulted on as thoroughly as the issues we have looked at at stage one. So... I'm, I'm very, I would agree with Colin that it does deserve proper consultation. Um, what I'm a bit unsure about, and I suppose I'm relaxed about, is do we delay completing the stage one report in order to now take evidence uh, and uh, include that in the stage one report, or do we let the stage one report go ahead and do the uh, consultation in between, uh, effectively, stage one and stage two? And I, I, as I say, I don't have strong views on either side, but I do think we should do proper consultation. Okay. Yeah, uh, Maureen. Yeah, I mean, I'm just kind of basically following on from what John said. I think we've got two options here. Um, this is going to be a substantial part seven to this bill. Um, so normally at this stage in a bill, because we've taken evidence and everything, you'd probably complete the report. Um, and have the stage one debate and then consult prior to stage two. But given, given the fact that we've heard from the government because of Brexit, because that was, I think the, uh, the, the, the intention maybe to delay it came before the budget stuff, um, we have now got a window where we can decide whether we want to consult before we complete the report. I'm not sure I've come to a decision one way or another, probably consult at stage two, but I'm, I, I think it's something that the committee should maybe decide and you get the views of every single member. Okay. Colin. I, just, I, mean, I think yeah, that's a very good point. Um, my own view is that we should complete the current stage one report, but make it very clear that we were going to consult further because all the evidence that we've been given for the Stage 1 report is based on the bill as it stands and all the organisations may have very different views um, but they haven't had the opportunity to do that so it would be unfair to, to quote evidence given by an organisation who hasn't had an opportunity to consider um, the proposal for a workplace park and levy so I think effectively you're almost having two Stage 1 reports if you like, you might not call it that but I think that's important to, to, to do that but I think our Stage 1 report is based on the evidence that we have in the bill before us and I think it's important to do a similar process in my view as thorough with uh, such a, a material change that's been proposed other parts of the bill, so it's completely kind of standalone. Stuart, can um, Just as a matter of process, I, pre I very much welcome the fact we've got a window to look at this before we actually consider stage two amendments. Point one. Point two, I think, I, 
I suspect parliamentary process would allow us to open it up in the stage one bill. I think, however, that would then potentially disadvantage people who've participated in the stage one. So I think the report we've got, we should complete and we should contemplate publishing it. We should then make a separate report on this narrow point um, and consult on that. So, uh, narrow, narrow in the sense, narrow in the sense um, that, that, that it's not about going back to all the witnesses who've already participated and asking their view on this. Okay. Um, John, do you want to say something and then I'll try and sum up where I think we're going on this. Or, oh, sorry. Uh, Jamie, yeah. Do you want to respond? Sorry. Okay. Jamie. Th thank you, John. Uh, just to make a few points then. I'm, I think, um, and, and first of all, from the outset, I'll say I'm not going to pass any comment as to the merits of the amendment or the policy around it. I think that's a debate not for this arena, it's for another day, and, and I'm happy to park that aside. So my comments are more on the process by which we should follow, and again, these are just my views. If this is a, a substantive uh, addition to the bill, and by addition I mean a new section, for example, or a new uh, concept which has not previously been taken evidence on, my position is that I don't think that the committee should be entertaining the prospect of including it in the transport bill. I would argue whether the, the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee is the place for this policy and this piece of legislation. One could argue that the government should bring this forward as a standalone piece of legislation that would be assigned to the appropriate committee to which the subject, to which the subject matter is relevant. If, however, the committee is of agreement, sorry, if, however, the committee... When the clerk's whispering in my ear, just so you I appreciate know, it's very I, I can, I, I, I'm absolutely listening to you, and, and I'm used to, in, in my previous occupation to have one radio coming in one ear and one coming in the other ear. I can do that. It's when people are shouting over each other that I find it difficult. So, Jamie, crack on. I'm listening Marvellous. To, um, to exactly what you're saying. I'm, I'm, I'm enthused by your hearing abilities, convener. Um, uh, my, my point being is that if the committee over agrees that they, they are willing to accept this, um, I call it an amendment, but uh, this additional subject matter into this bill, given that we're at the end of the stage one process, my understanding is that the stage one report has to be debated in the chamber by the parliament and then voted on. Uh, in other words, that the bill can then proceed. I don't see how the parliament can proceed on the bill as it's drafted in the knowledge that there a substantive piece that will be added to it at stage two that we have not taken evidence on in a formal environment. It is imperative that stakeholders are given the opportunity to go through the due process that every other bit of this bill has been given by this committee uh, if it's to pr proceed. So I would recommend, I would not support adding this to this bill uh, as a matter of principle, but if it does, then I would request that we extend the stage one process to allow this to be added to the report. Yeah. Yeah, um, uh, John, are you happy to, to listen to what people are saying yes, and then come can. back? Yes. Yeah. So, so Peter and then and then Mike. Yeah, thanks, Convener. I, I have a lot of sympathy with what the, uh, Jamie has just said. I, I just I do wonder if this new piece of legislation does actually fit within the transport bill. I have serious doubts as to whether it does fit. Um, so when, and that would be the first dis decision we need to take, I think. And if, if it does fit and it, it, and it does become part of this bill, then it's absolutely imperative that we take, you know, we take a, 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 a plenty of evidence. We've, we've done it for all the other parts of the bill. We need to be, we need to have time to take uh, substantial amounts of evidence because this is a, this is a huge uh, additional piece of, uh, of. Uh, of uh, information that we need to take in, on board. So, um, how would how you actually do it? I I don't know, but I do wonder if it's part of this bill at all. Okay, Mark. <clears throat> Can I just say though, I, th I think what we're dealing with is, is something completely different from our normal process. If it was a normal process, then um, we deal it with a normal way, and we deal with the stage two. And, and often people would say, that stage two, I've said it myself, that the people who brought forward a, a stage two amendment that we haven't taken evidence on, we would reject it on that. I would reject it on that, on that ground alone. <clears throat> However, this is not a normal process. For the first time, we have a situation, I think it's the first time, first time we have a situation where there is a political agreement. I'm not making the merits or demerits of it, but there is a fact. There's a political agreement between the Scottish Government 
and another party in the Parliament, the Greens. The Scot is, as far as I am aware, the Finance Minister said in the Chamber that the SNP members would support, even though we don't know what it is yet, would support the amendment uh, that the Greens bring forward. So what we've got is a situation where it's not, it's not a normal amendment. In other words, the amendment will come forward and the majority of members of this committee are already committed by the Finance Minister in the Chamber to say that they will vote for it, even though we haven't taken any... We don't know what it is, we haven't taken any evidence, and we don't know what the conclusions are. So it is not a normal process. So I would say that in normal, normally we should complete our Stage 1 report and have the Stage 1 debate and then move on to Stage 2. Normally, this is not a normal process. So I would think we, would, we as a committee, would, could appear rather in a strange situation. Now, we, we complete a report on Stage 1. We then have programmed a, a debate on the Stage 1 of this process while everybody... Exactly, the principles of this bill. Well, everybody knows a major issue we cannot debate in the chamber on, on, on this bill. So that's why I say this is an, an unusual, if not unique, situation that I have come across in my experience since 1999. Um, and we need to treat it in, in a special way. So I would argue that we should, uh, as the Minister of Parliamentary Business has made, made clear, he's quite happy that Parliament delays our consideration of stage one and therefore the stage one debate. Let us take evidence. If John has said he's quite happy to bring his amendment as soon as he has it written down to us for our consideration. We should then go through the process of delay the stage one report while we can consult it, when we can take evidence and then produce our report. And then we can have a proper debate in the parliament on the bill. Okay. Can I just ask for clarification? Sorry, Jamie. No, it's okay. Um, and I'm not bothered either way. Are you saying it should be included in this report or a separate report? I think it would be... I think we would look odd if we produced our stage one report on the transport bill knowing, and not being able to refer to it in, in, the, in the report, knowing that, the, that this major element of yeah, the yeah, bill... Yeah, yeah, that's all right. I'm just saying... I, 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 so I, I'm proposing that we, postpone, that we postpone it so we do it properly. R well, Richard and then Jamie. I'll, I'll remind people on... on the, I'll, I'll go back and check the, the official record, but during the roadworks part of this bill, there was a chap come in and he raised the workplace parking levy, and that's when I made my comment at that time. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't see the, the problem of people saying this shouldn't have been this, this bill. I look forward to a proposal being brought forward by the Greens and Mr Finney in regards to this, and, and I, I expect I will vote for it. Uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not presupposing, but I, I, I am, I am uh, reminded, I am reminded that it was raised during the roadworks part of this bill uh, by one of the, the, the members, because you asked them, have you any, anything else to say? And, the, and one of the people came out with the, the workplace parking levy. Okay, Jamie. Yeah, just in response to Mike Rumble's point where he made the differentiation about, about what is usual due process for how committees pass legislation and commented that this is an unusual process or this is not standard process. I think we as a committee need to be prepared to say to the government that we will not accept unusual process. We will continue with due process because that is how we as committees legislate. And I don't think because a, a policy decision has been made by the government for the government of the day to then request a member of a different party in a committee to introduce that policy to an existing piece of legislation, please let me finish, uh, then by default they are veering from the due process that we should follow. So I'm not arguing against, the, against or for the proposition. I think that is, again, an argument we have on a different day and there will be many views and we will have ample opportunity to express those views. But my premise is around ensuring that this committee does what it's supposed to do in the way that it's supposed to do it. So I don't think we should veer from normal process uh, in that respect. And that's why I'm saying that we should not accept this as an addition to the bill. 
Yeah. John Finney, and then I'm going to try and summarise where I think we are and, and, and try and see a route forward through well, this, John. Uh, uh, thank you, Convener. Can I thank colleagues for their comments? And uh, the, the reason that I contacted yourself and the clerk was for this specific reason. Can I say a few things, though, about... And I know we're not going to discuss the individual merit. I've had an amendment written about this for some considerable time. And, and of course... Um, and, and it then features in discussions with another, another party. I am bringing forward an amendment. I, I think you can safely assume I'll be bringing forward other amendments, um, but I'm not um, flagging them up. I'm flagging this up as a courtesy, given the profile that this issue has received. I am not wanting anything to circumvent any procedures. I think this absolutely important. The other proposals I'll bring forward at stage two, they'll stand and fall on their merits, as this one will. And it may be that any amendment that's brought at stage through that, that in any way doesn't fit with some of the, the work we've done and we can't always scrutinise to the level of detail that we want, um, people could say, as they could on any piece of legislation, you know, we haven't really taken enough evidence in that. There are, yeah, I absolutely expect the, the committee to scrutinise this. I've tried to uh, be helpful by um, flagging this up in advance and I'm grateful that there's been an opportunity to discuss it on the agenda and I will absolutely assist you and the, the clerks in uh, okay. helping the committee uh, look at this. OK. The first thing uh, I would like to say without wanting to cut anyone off, I think everyone's had a chance to, to say something on this, is that, first of all, the, the bill that we're looking at is a government bill. Uh, which we're looking at, and anyone at any stage during a government bill can bring forward amendments at stage two. So I think what's important uh, when we're considering this is to also bear in mind the importance of standing orders and the procedures of this parliament, which I must ensure as a committee we comply with. The other thing I, I just caution people about is, is you know, we, we, it is clear from around the committee table that everyone wants to take evidence and hear evidence from people on, on this amendment. And that's the, the ability that we have. So I, I've, I've logged uh, that, that you want to take evidence. I'm logged that you, everyone wants to consider it. And John could, in theory, have, have lodged this amendment at stage two without telling us if it hadn't come out. So we have to bear that in mind. I, I, I personally think, as convener of a committee and a committee member, to, to bring something in at stage two of a debate, having not looked at it when you've looked at the bill at stage one, is, is, is wrong from the committee, but that's my personal opinion. So if I was bringing an amendment in at stage two, I would like to see it at least had airway during stage one. So my, so my proposal to the committee is that, first of all, that we continue to work on the stage one uh, report, which is based on the bill that's in front of us. We will not be in a position uh, to publish that uh, till after recess anyway, um, so that there is some time. I then would like to clarify what the procedures are for this parliament in relation to this. I then would like to speak to uh, the government minister, uh, Graham Day, uh, for as far as business is concerned, to find out more about deadlines and timings. I then would like to take the opportunity to speak to John Finney about the amendment and try and get a wording for it. And then I'd like to come back with you, to you as a committee, with what the proposals I think that would be appropriate, based on those discussions today, to hear evidence on the amendment that, that we have not yet seen. But, and at that stage, we can decide how we take to the stage one report forward, whether to publish it at that stage or whether to hold off. My, my feeling is, is to do so now would be wrong. But I absolutely believe that it would be wrong in any shape or form to prejudge this and we need to take evidence on it and hear clearly the evidence and then make up our mind as a committee on the evidence that we hear on whether it's a good proposal or not in the same way that we do on all amendments uh, and, and government bills. So that would be the way I would propose to deal with it. Does anyone think that I have fundamentally missed anything um, and I'm wrong? So, Happy to hear your views, Mike. Just the word consultation you never mentioned. I think when we do this, we need a very short consultation before we invite people to give evidence. It, 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 let, let, let me see the procedure and let me find out exactly what's being done. But I understand that there are a lot of people out there that, that may have a comment on it. And we need to make sure that when the government uh, 
worked out the time scale for this bill, that we are given time to do our job properly as a committee. Because you have always made it clear to me as, uh, as your convener that we are not going to be driven by the government. We are to be driven by the way we look at the legislation and do it properly and not be constrained by government time sales. And I am mindful of that at all times. Jamie. Thank you. I don't disagree with anything you said. I think just wanted to clarify for the record, however, that it's still unclear as to whether uh, this additional subject matter or this additional topic uh, should or, or will uh, be included in the Stage 1 report or will be dealt with as a Stage 2 amendment. And I think if it is dealt with as a Stage 2 amendment, then knowing that in advance of completing and publishing the Stage 1 report, then we're fundamentally missing the point here. And that's that if we know it's coming and we know the subject matter because it's well rehearsed publicly, uh, then it should form part of the Stage 1 to give it that due process that it deserves. Uh, so for that reason, I wouldn't consent to the overall approach that you mentioned. Well, let, let's come back after recess when I have more information to consider it. But all we can do as a committee when it comes to the Stage 1 report is to consider what is in the bill. That, that as far as we can go. Now, we can caveat our Stage 1 report, um, but I would look to the clerks for advice for that. And I don't want to make a decision on that um, and, until we've discussed it as a committee, how we want to handle it. Mike. We can say in our report that we all are, all are aware of what was coming down the track because it's in the public domain by the finance minister in Parliament. And we can comment in our report on that. It, it, indeed we can, but till we have more information, in fairness, till we know more about what's happening and the timescales, I think it would be wrong to make a decision on any, any particular mm -hmm. item. Um, I, I therefore would ask if you, if you would... Uh, support me in, in, in what I'm proposing to do on your behalf and report back to you post the recess. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we're now going to move into private session. Um, so well, I close, formally close the meeting.